I know at least one board member is on the way, so we'll go ahead and start. All right, so this morning we have dedicated a, a good amount of time to discuss something really important. This is going to be basically the kickoff for the strategic plan work in our academic area. Um, just one second, let me pull up something. So just to remind ourselves, because we've been through a lot, and uh, let's just check where we're at. So we have our new strategic plan, five goals. The span of this plan is seven years from this year through 2020. And to implement this plan each year, there's a focus on selected priorities in each of the five goals. So since we're at the beginning of the plan, we want to know where we're starting. So we're going to receive baseline reports for these priorities so we know where we're starting and the work being proposed to meet the goal. So today, we're going to look at goal three, which is our academic uh, growth goal. And the three priorities we're looking at are reading by third grade, Algebra 1 by 8th grade, and advanced coursework in high school, which also includes CTE. So today, the focus is to really ask, are the things that the staff have proposed to look at, the data, are, are they all inclusive of the things we might want to know so that we can measure this growth? So I will leave it at that for now. I, I hope everyone had time to read this very detailed report, and I think especially helpful was the intersectionality data piece at the end, because that's something that the board frequently asks for. So with that, I will turn it over to Marcy. Good morning. Good morning, board members, and thank you, Ms. Marin, for setting the table well for us today. Um, if we could go ahead and pull up the presentation, and while that's being pulled up, I do want to make sure that um, board members are aware we did post um, an additional attachment to board docs that you have a hard copy of sitting in front of you with some information um, about VAP and SOL um, divisions, and we apologize for that oversight. The reading VAP information was disaggregated by SOL, um, but these additional um, pieces of information are being posted now and will be added to the final report for the Monday vote. Um, in addition, you do have a copy of all the goal three metrics um, based on the measures that the board approved that are sitting in front of you. So. Good morning, everyone. Um, as Ms. Marin said, today is the first of five goal report presentations that we'll be making to the board this school year. The purpose of these baseline um, goal reports are to let the board and the public know where we're starting with our new strategic plan and how we're going to make our plan a reality to accomplish our goals for each and every one of our students. It's important, I think, to note uh, for, for the public that the data that's being presented today is on areas where the division is trying to improve. Um, and it doesn't represent the totality of FCPS data by design. Um, we report our accomplishments in lots of different ways in other presentations and publications, including our sharing our success report that's available online. So what we're gonna look at today is really that strategic data that we're trying to move for the division. So our objectives for today, um, today's baseline report, as Ms. Marin shared, is for goal three, academic growth and excellence. And our um, focus for today's presentation is going to be on those three areas of students reading on grade level by the end of third grade, successful completion of algebra one by eighth grade, and successful completion of advanced coursework in high school. The full report is posted on board docs. We're going to share um, a brief update on the work that's taken place since the board adopted the strategic plan in June, and then we're going to discuss the baseline for each of those areas. Uh, within the presentation, we're going to share some information about what the division is currently doing to meet these goals, and then discuss additional work that's either under consideration or development in order to meet these goals. The board's going to vote on the strategic, um, the baseline report on November 20th, and what we're presenting today really represents our framework and our approach for moving forward. And we're seeking board feedback as we start this journey to make sure we're headed in the right direction. We're looking forward to hearing feedback from the board and answering any questions that may, um, you may have prior to the November 20th action. So as a reminder to our public, the board adopted the 2023-2030 strategic plan in June of this year. The adopted plan has those five student center goals, each with our equity commitments that um, are the support for each and every student in attaining our goals. There are measures for each of the five goals that share our progress, and there are four pillars that serve as the foundation for our division work towards those goals. 
Immediately following the adoption of the new strategic plan, staff began work to set the plan in motion. And in the subsequent slides, I'm going to briefly touch on that strategic plan work to date. So the adoption of the strategic plan set a vision for the division for the next seven years. And to make that vision a reality, the divisions identified data that's needed to measure our progress towards our goals and our 31 measures that the board approved. Those data are called our metrics. And it's possible for each of the board approved measures, we're going to need more than one data point or metric to understand our progress. And you'll see that in today's report. As Dr. Reed previously shared, those metrics may change over time as we find better ways to measure our progress towards meeting our goals. In the full report appendix, and as well as on the copies you received today, you've got all the initial metrics for the goal three. In addition, we've identified priorities for our first year of implementation, as Ms. Marin shared, along this seven-year journey, and we're going to share that. So this slide shows our division priorities that we've selected for our strategic plan work in year one. The year one priorities represent a mix of work that the division's been focused on, as well as some new work for our division. They include data that's going to help us improve student access and opportunity, as well as performance on key success indicators for our students. As we present the data today for goal three, we're also going to share why goal three um, selections for reading by third grade, algebra one, and advanced coursework are an important focus for our division. As Ms. Marin shared, this um, strategic plan is a seven-year journey, and it was designed that way to help us attain all of our goals no later than 2030. Prior to the adoption of the new strategic plan, FCPS was in various stages of addressing the goals and measures that are outlined in the plan. In some cases, we were already implementing strategies to improve the measures the board adopted. And in some cases, these measures are new work for the division. Our strategic work to um, accomplish these outcomes is going to go through a cycle of development, implementation, and monitoring. And on the slide, you can see a, an example of the visual representation of what this might look like. So, the Ds represent work that we would be developing. The Is and sort of the bold blue represent as we would implement new strategies in the division. And then as things are successful, we would move on to a monitoring stage to make sure that our work was staying on course and our measures were moving in the right direction. Once we've, um, this staggered approach helps our division to be successful with a key set of priorities each year and make sure that the system does not get overwhelmed with multiple initiatives in any one year. Attaining our goals by 2030 is going to look different for each of our measures and for each individual student group. So the baseline data you're going to hear today represents the starting point for the work. For all of our goals, our 2030 target for, is for overall um, student and student subgroup data to be at or above the 90% level. So for some of our metrics, we're going to be close or at or above that 90% level. And for some of our metrics, we're going to be further away. So in the example on this slide, you can see that that middle, this would be like an example metric. That middle line would represent all students, so um, a 70% starting point. The highest performing student group on this measure, on this example, is that 80% starting point. And the lowest performing student group on this sample measure would be at 35%. So you can see those lines are going to look different as we try to get to that end seven-year point um, of getting all students at or above that 90%. Our annual targets for our goals are going to look different depending on our starting points, um, and we'll continue to monitor and adjust those each year. The year one's Dr. Eden. Thanks, Marcy. Would you go back to that slide just for a minute? Because I think we're kind of zipping through some of these, and I want to make sure we understand why this slide's important. And there was a slide before, too. Uh, but in this case, what I think what the team is sharing is that depending on the goal or depending on the um, starting point of a particular goal to reach the closing of achievement gaps, you're going to have different slopes to those lines. And I was just in a math class at Irving Middle School this morning, and our students are studying slope right now, rise over run. The, why that's important to remember, and they were doing a very good job of it, um, but why that's important is for a, high, you know, a more steep slope, that's a different type of acceleration. So when we think about that and we think about the tolerance range for where we need to be each year so we actually reach the goal, right? We can't do it in one year, but that tolerance, we can't be outside of that standard deviation. But we may need to apply more resources 
to a goal that has a steeper slope because we have to move more quickly to close the gap. So I think there's an intersectionality. And again, we're really working to make this visual and transparent for our community. Um, there are some slopes that may not be quite as steep, which may require less resources. And by that, we're not just talking about money. We're also, I think our most important resource is staff time. So when we think about it on any given year, how much time, how many resources, uh, what can we do to actually support that data point moving? So this slide really captures that we're gonna have to differentiate our approach um, year over year and um, strategy over strategy as we look at this. So this, I just wanna make sure I draw our attention to that, so thank you. So our year one strategies are being used to align the division work. We talked a lot in that planning process about the importance of alignment to accomplish our goals. For our schools, the strategic priorities um, run through their annual school improvement plan. Um, so for each of the three goals we're gonna talk about today, the um, reading by third grade, algebra one, and advanced high school coursework, those were in required components as a part of our school's um, school improvement plans this year. And we're gonna provide an update to the board at the November 20th board meeting on our SIP work. At the department level, we've introduced department improvement plans this year, and that those plans are aligned with our strategic plan work, specifically with our pillars as we work our, um, our plan being to, our plan being deeply embedded in the organizational work. Mm -hmm. And then finally, the strategic plan uh, priorities become the focus work of our cross departmental goal teams that will drive the strategies to address the achievement opportunity and access gaps that exist within these goals. So using these existing structures and some new structures, we ensure that this work is deeply embedded in our organization um, to help us move forward towards our goals. And then as we begin to implement this new strategic plan, we're, uh, we're using data to inform both the implementation and the monitoring pro progress monitoring for our plan. So we've built a number of data dashboards for schools and division leaders, and we're continuing to build out those dashboards to monitor key performance indicators and to monitor student progress outcomes so that we have the ability to address any things that we're seeing along the way um, that might need to make adjustments to achieve our goals. We're also developing an annual evaluation and research plan to help us better understand what's working well in the organization with relation to these strategic priorities and what adjustments are needed to make sure all of our students are able to successfully meet these goals. And then finally, we'll be using data to identify promising practices. We know some schools are doing a great job with some of these things already to figure out what's going well in those schools, how we can pilot those activities at other schools and then really bring those effective strategies to scale. We're now gonna um, share our focus baseline data within goal three. And so just briefly to give um, the board and the public some information about baseline data. The baseline data included in this report, um, whenever possible, provides three years worth of data to provide that stable base that accounts for any anomalies in the data, things like changes to SOLs, standards, assessments. Um, the baseline report is gonna provide information for all of our students on each of the metrics and also additional disaggregated <clears throat> data within student groups. In the English learner section and the students with disabilities section, you'll also see additional disaggregations around English language proficiency and whether or not students with disabilities are spending the majority of their instructional time in an inclusive or a special education setting. <clears throat> There's also intersectionality data included in portions of the report that focus on our economically disadvantaged English learners and student disability groups. So at this point, I'm gonna turn the presentation over to Dr. Presidio. All right, well, thank you very much, Marcy, and uh, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm happy to be here with you and have this opportunity to talk about where we're at with respect to our performance around these uh, key uh, priority measures, and then, of course, the work that we're doing uh, to support increases to student performance in these areas. So the very first uh, priority measure that we're going to look at in goal three is reading on grade level by third grade. And... Um, you know, as we, I think as we all know, third grade literacy obviously is a key milestone for student success. It really marks that time in a student's educational experience when they move from learning to read to reading to learn. Um, and we also know from research that students that aren't reading on grade level by the end of third grade um, have a lot of difficulty comprehending content that's going to be taught in subsequent years, not just in language arts, but in other subjects as well. In fact, 
Uh, we've got some recent research that really indicates that third graders who are not reading on grade level uh, by the end of third grade are four times more likely to drop out of high school. And research has also found that students who are reading on grade level um, by third grade attend college at um, uh, significantly higher rates than their peers. So this is a really, really important uh, metric and, and measure for us as a system. So you'll see a series of slides like this for each of the priority measures, and I just kind of wanted to explain a little bit about what's going on here. So we're looking right now at our third grade reading measure, and for that measure, which is really the outcome that we want to achieve, all students uh, reading on grade level by the end of third grade, we have two key accountability metrics. And in simple terms, the metrics are basically just a way to kind of tell us where we're at in terms of progressing towards that outcome of that key uh, measure that we're looking at of reading on grade level by third grade. So we've got two key performance metrics uh, for this third grade reading measure. The first is the pass rate on the third grade SOL or the VAP test. And then the second is the percent of schools that increase their student percentage of students reading on grade level by third grade by more than 5% over that baseline data. Um, so you can see that there is represented by 36% currently for our baseline data. So in an FCPS right now, currently we have 69% of our current third graders reading on grade level. Um, and this is above the state average of 65%, so we continue to be above the state average. Um, but we also, of course, have significant reading gaps that are continuing to persist. Um, but we do have data that's indicating that we're making good progress beyond just that uh, SOL measure. For example, last year we saw in our iReady data that we had a 12% increase in students making that grade level reading progress. And uh, in Lexia, which is another support intervention program, the percentage of uh, third grade students that were performing significantly below grade level decreased to only 18%. So that was really good news as well. So I think these are promising um, data indicators that are telling us that we're on the right track. We obviously have a lot of work to continue to do, um, but we are seeing some good initial results of our work. Now, on this slide, you'll see a couple of these as well, so I think we need to explain this a little bit too. There's a lot kind of going on on this slide. Uh, basically, what you're seeing is the current performance of our FCPS students overall and by subgroup on that third grade reading measure. So you can see from the kind of the blue student icons uh, for each of those uh, groups, all students and the student subgroups. So if you just look at the all students at the top, um, that's representing the 69% of our students reading on grade level currently. You don't actually see the number on that slide because there's really not a lot of room to, to put the number values on there, but the number values are in the associated narrative and we've got charts for all of this in the narrative. Uh, and for this particular measure, it's on page 13. But you can see the approximation there um, of 69% of students reading on grade level from that first bar at the top. So to reach our target for next year, basically that means that our results are going to need to increase to 74%. So you can see the target that illustrates where we are trying to get to for next year. And the reason it's 74% is because we've set a 5% increase uh, target for school year 23-24. And then ultimately, you can see in the far right-hand side of that chart, uh, our final target would exceed 90% uh, for each student subgroup by 2030. So that basically just means that, you know, again, we continue to have similar expectations for all of our students. Now, of course, um, as both Dr. Rita and Marcy talked about, it is going to take multiple years uh, for us to reach these targets, and some groups uh, have farther to go than others. Um, and also it's important, I think, when we look at the third grade reading to understand this isn't just a third grade measure, right? It does, we're not just doing work at third grade. Student reading gaps actually form even before kindergarten. So this is going to be work that we're doing at all of our primary grades. Um, so that just gives you a sense of how to read kind of our current performance levels. What I want to do next is talk just a little bit about some, well, maybe not a little bit, maybe a lot, about some of the work that we're doing to improve our students' literacy skills. And first, I think you'll uh, certainly remember back in 2021, we made the really important decision as a school division to implement new literacy practices grounded in science-based reading research. And that was really a transformational change uh, that began with the adoption of our Equitable Access to Literacy Plan. And that's really resulted in a significant shift um, in our curriculum, our instruction, our assessment practices, and our professional development that we offer. So last school year, um, we did make some significant implementation progress. We adopted new universal screening practices to make sure that we're identifying students with reading difficulties uh, as early as possible. 
Um, and we actually saw that with some of the work that we were doing uh, to provide systematic and explicit instruction with our new curriculum guides, that we've been making some good progress. So students have made gains of over 14% um, in the phonics domain when we look at our assessment information. That's really important. And some of the student subgroup scores are even higher than that 14%. So taking some of those early actions is paying off. But this is work that's going to have to be ongoing. Um, and part of what we need to do on an ongoing basis is make sure that we're really training our teachers and providing them with the highest quality professional development. So last year, um, we started to implement some evidence-based professional development programs. The first uh, is called LETTERS, and that's just an acronym that stands for uh, Language Essentials for Teachers of Reading and Spelling. Um, and it's a program that really provides evidence-based reading uh, instructional practices uh, to teachers. And last year, all of our central office staff members um, and literacy leaders um, that work in supporting literacy in the schools completed that training. And this year, we've got 1,500 teachers who are going to complete the letters training. So that's really a significant increase. Um, additionally, we've been providing Orton-Gillingham training through the Institute of Multisensory Education. Uh, and that sometimes is referred to as OG. So the OG is really an approach uh, for teaching the structure and the code of the English language. Um, and it's recognized really worldwide as you know, being highly effective for teaching students with persistent reading difficulties, um, particularly students that might be manifesting um, issues and characteristics of dyslexia. So I'm excited to be able to say that by the end of this year, we will have trained 2,000 teachers across the division in Orton-Gillingham. So again, that's a lot of work um, that folks have been doing in our schools. And then um, the other thing that's really, I think, exciting news here is the adoption of a new basal resource for our elementary language arts program. We haven't done an adoption for 20 years in elementary language arts, and that's really led to a lot of inconsistencies across schools, um, as well as some of the inequitable outcomes that we're seeing for students. But as everybody knows, uh, we're very, very excited to be adopting a new resource this school year uh, for all of our elementary classrooms. So in K-6, we'll have a brand new um, Tier 1 core curriculum for all schools that will be implemented at the beginning of next school year. Um, we're being very intentional about the adoption process, and we'll be selecting a set of materials that have been approved by uh, the Virginia Department of Education. Um, so we'll know for sure that those uh, materials have been vetted and that they'll really be aligned to uh, science-based literacy instruction. We're also going to have to do a lot of training of our elementary language arts teachers, though, because this is going to be a really heavy lift for them to implement these materials. So we're going to start with professional development um, this spring, continue that in the summer, and then continue to support teachers um, next school year. But again, we're very excited because this is going to mean that all of our classrooms are going to have the highest quality instructional materials, and all of our students will be receiving evidence-based uh, literacy instruction. So the next uh, priority measure that we want to talk about is successful completion of Algebra 1 by 8th grade. And again, Algebra 1 completion by 8th grade is another one of those key milestones that is really important for student success. Um, we know that students who take Algebra 1 by 8th grade can access advanced math courses later in um, middle school and high school. Uh, students can take courses like AP, IB courses, dual enrollment courses, and other advanced classes that are really going to prepare them for success in fields like uh, science, math, technology, engineering. And research really supports the importance of al taking Algebra 1 by 8th grade as well. There's a recent study um, that found that after uh, taking Algebra 1 in the 8th grade, that student enrollment in advanced courses in high school, particularly in 9th grade, increases significantly uh, by 30% in 9th grade and continues throughout that trajectory all the way through the 12th grade. So it's really kind of the, the on-ramp for students to be able to take um, advanced courses throughout their high school experience. Um, research also found that scores increase for students. So overall math scores in 10th grade rise as a result of having more students enrolled uh, in completing Algebra 1 in 8th grade. And then research has indicated that certain subgroups like uh, English, language uh, English language learners, girls, um, and students of color really benefit uh, most significantly from taking uh, Algebra 1 earlier in their experiences when you look at the subsequent courses that those student groups enroll in. So this is a really important metric for us. And I want to share a little bit about where we currently are on this metric. Again, we have uh, two accountability metrics associated with Algebra 1 by 8th grade. 
The first is looking at the percent of our students who receive a verified credit in Algebra One at the end of eighth grade. And that just basically means that the student uh, passed both the course and the associated uh, SOL at the end of that course. And then second, our second metric here is the percent of schools again that are making that expected progress towards having increased enrollment in successful completion in Algebra One by eighth grade for the students in their school. So our current data um, indicate that 51% of our current students um, are successfully completing Algebra One by the end of eighth grade. That's significantly higher than the national average of 24%. And that 24% actually just represents students being enrolled in Algebra One. We don't have data to know how many of those students that are enrolled nationally actually pass the class and then pass any end of course tests. So we are quite, uh, quite a ways further than national averages. However, <laughs> we're not where we need to be on this important metric. We've got really significant persistent gaps for some of our student subgroups, and we've got a lot of work to do here in this particular uh, goal area. So with respect to where our students uh, and student subgroups are currently at, you can see on this slide that the current performance of FCPS students um, is represented again on that top bar, so uh, the overall uh, performance for all students at FCPS is currently at 51%. And again, if we apply that 5% performance target increase, um, we're going to hope to reach 56% of our students successfully completing Algebra 1 by eighth grade uh, during this school year. And then again, you can see our final target would exceed 90% for all student subgroups. And just like we described uh, with reading, we do expect that this measure is going to take several years and certain subgroups are going to need more support, obviously, than others to achieve this benchmark. So what are we doing when it comes to supporting Algebra 1 success? Well, we do have a lot of great things happening in this area as well. Uh, you might recall at the October 26th board meeting, uh, we discussed the work of the uh, Algebra Access Network Improvement Community. And basically, that's just a fancy name for the group of schools that are working. We've got about 15 middle schools. That group of schools is working with central office staff to really understand the root causes uh, of why students aren't successful in enrolling in, in Algebra One earlier and developing strategies um, and actions that we can take to, to increase that enrollment. So we've already seen some really positive results from the work of the schools that are participating in, in this network. Uh, for example, um, schools in the network have uh, been focusing on the academic advising process. And with just a subset of schools focusing on academic advising, our overall enrollment uh, for this school year in Algebra One by eighth grade has increased to 64%. Um, so that's promising for work that's just uh, really at, at uh, the initial stages. And of course, all of our schools are going to have the opportunity uh, to participate in this work um, in the coming years. Another thing um, to note here is the idea of making sure that we have targeted professional development for everyone in the schools that are involved in the academic advising process. It's not just counselors, it's teachers who make recommendations and provide advice to, uh, to students and other staff members uh, that might be working with students as well. And we've had an open enrollment policy in, in FCPS since 2011. Um, basically what that means is that students don't have any prerequisites to enroll in particular classes like Algebra 1 by 8th grade. Um, it's open for them to enroll in it if they choose to do so. However, we've had that policy in place for almost 15 years now really, right? And our uh, enrollment rates have really been relatively flat um, and we've really not seen the, the types of increases and in gains uh, for particular student subgroups that are really disproportionately low as well. So we know that we've got more work to do here. So one of the big things that we're doing is providing a lot of professional development to our schools um, to really support students and families in the academic advising uh, process. And we're working with staff members to make sure that they have best practices and are using best practices in academic advising and working to really promote students' uh, self-efficacy when it comes to algebra readiness. Um, so we're excited about that work that's happening as well. And then another big thing that we need to do is focus on curriculum revisions. So we're adding algebraic content into our curriculum in fifth grade, sixth grade, and seventh grade so that all of our eighth graders are going to feel more prepared 
uh, for the abstract concepts uh, that will be taught in algebra. So hopefully by you know having success, early success, starting as early as fifth grade with some of this content, student self-efficacy again will increase and students will be uh, feel more comfortable enrolling in Algebra One. Another thing that we're doing is embedding computer science and STEAM into the math curriculum in our early elementary grades. And again, that provides additional opportunities for students to develop those skills and understandings that are gonna prepare them for success with those kind of abstract algebraic concepts. And again, continuing that professional development is going to be really, really important. Uh, we're doing PD this year, but it's gonna have to be a multi-year initiative of professional development if we're gonna be able to achieve our performance targets. And then the third um, and final priority measure in goal three is around the successful completion of algebra, or excuse me, of completion of advanced coursework in high school. So <clears throat> again, we know from the national research that uh, students who have experience with uh, completing and participating college level coursework while in high school are gonna be a lot more likely to enroll in, uh, persist, and actually graduate from college and graduate on time. So this is another one of these really significant um, outcome measures when we think about student opportunities and future opportunities. And the research, again, supports this really well. So um, the National Association for College Admissions Counseling has really identified the top three factors in college admissions decisions are the grades that students receive in college preparation courses, a student's total GPA, and then the strength of the high school curriculum. So getting students enrolled in advanced courses, again, has a strong correlation with their future success in college and beyond. Um, the research also points to uh, additional benefits of taking advanced coursework in high school, um, like improvements in student self-esteem, uh, higher engagement in the learning process, and even fewer absences and fewer suspensions uh, in school. And then, of course, you think about the, the benefits to students and families in terms of cost savings, because lots of times students can get college credit for the courses they complete in high school, uh, which helps them really um, from a financial standpoint and a time standpoint in terms of even being able to leave college earlier. And then another big thing in this area uh, is the important work around our career pathways courses in high school and making sure that students have the opportunities to really explore and prepare for potential uh, future career opportunities, um, have the opportunity to earn um, CTE certificates as well as uh, participate in work-based learning. So that's all part of the work that we hope to do in our advanced coursework measure. So again, where are we kind of currently at now? Well, first, there's two different metrics that we're using for this accountability measure. And, and the first is the percent of students in the senior cohort who earn a grade of a C minus or higher in at least one AP, IB, or dual enrollment course, or uh, students who complete a CTE program before graduation. So that's our first metric to measure our success. And then second, again, is that look at what's happening in schools. So increasing the percent of schools that uh, increase their percentage of students who are taking advanced coursework or CTE coursework uh, by five percentage points over the baseline data. So when you look at our current performance here, you can see that 85% uh, of our students overall are successfully completing CTE or advanced coursework prior to graduation. Now, that's pretty good. It's better than the previous two measures that we looked at, but there's still a lot of work to do here. And you might recall um, from late spring and summer that the state actually put in place a new accountability measure that really aligns to our strategic uh, uh, plan measure here as well. And that's the College Career and Civic Readiness Index, or what we call the CCCRI. And that's related to high school accreditation now in the state of Virginia. Um, and if we're able to focus on this work here in terms of our strategic plan measure, that's going to help us, it's going to help our students, and it's going to help our accreditation as well because it will drive up our accreditation rankings on that new indicator. So we're excited to continue to partner with our high schools that already are doing some great things um, to strengthen that work over the coming years. And then we want to show you again just kind of the current performance, not just of all of our students, but where our student subgroups are. So you can see that represented on this slide. And again, you can see our um, overall performance at the top at 85%. And again, if we apply that 5% um, increase for this school year, overall we would hope to be at 90%. So there you can see 
that target already reaching over into the final target. And that's what Marcy alluded to. So on some of these measures, we're close, or for some student subgroups, we're already there. Uh, but for others, we obviously have a really long way to go. And uh, as Dr. Reed mentioned, that will allow us to really focus our efforts and supports to some of those particular student subgroups. So just a few things that I'd like to mention about the work that's happening um, in advanced coursework. And the first is academic and career planning. And that's really the, probably the most essential strategy to support uh, student enrollment in advanced courses. Um, we actually begin academic and career planning in the elementary grades with career interest inventories and goal setting activities. And then when students matriculate to middle and high school, they have opportunities to deepen their career exploration uh, by enrolling in uh, courses and career pathways and uh, advanced courses like AP and IB and dual enrollment. And additionally, all of our middle schools and high schools, our students participate in uh, advisory or what's sometimes called learning seminar, just depending on the school that the student is in. And that's an opportunity for students to work with uh, a faculty member once a week. Um, and we embed a lot of the work around academic and career planning into the advisory or the learning seminar session. And there's also some strategies here that uh, we're looking to expand, which you can see on the right-hand side of the slide. And the first is our AVID program. And we currently have AVID in 28 of our middle and high schools. And AVID is, uh, I think as you know, provides students with a lot of strategies and supports to really be successful in the most rigorous classes in FCPS. And our data is really showing that students that are participating in AVID are having really good outcomes. So just a couple data points I, I'd like to share with you. And the first is 62% um, of students who are uh, classified as free and reduced meals and who participate in AVID are successful in Algebra 1 by eighth grade. So 62% of AVID FRM students are successful in Algebra 1 by eighth grade. That compares with only 37% of similar FRM students who do, do not participate in AVID. Uh, similarly, at the high school level, 85% of our FRM students who participate in AVID are successful in com completing AP, IB, or dual enrollment courses compared with only 49% of FRM non-AVID students. So you can see, and we have other data points as well, but you can see there's a tremendous impact of supporting students in that targeted and intentional way through the AVID program. So we're hoping uh, over the coming years to be able to expand AVID into additional schools, uh, but also to be able to really spread those AVID strategies school-wide, not just have them contained in a particular AVID course, but use some of the strategies um, with students in all of their courses. So we're going to be offering expanded professional learning opportunities for teachers to learn about those strategies and apply them in their own courses. Um, and hopefully that's going to support even more of our students enrolling in advanced courses um, and, and completing them successfully. Another thing that you may remember uh, from last year is we had a career pathways study that we presented to the board. Um, and it talked about different opportunities for expanding some of our career pathway programs to more schools. Um, that's something that's tricky because it is funding related, um, but that's something that we hope to do over the coming years. There's a number of programs like our trades programs, uh, health occupation programs, JROTC programs um, that are really strong in some schools, but students in many of our other schools could benefit from participating in as well. And then finally, uh, we're continuing to focus at the elementary grade levels uh, to create greater access to STEAM and computer science. And again, there's strong research to support that. Um, research has shown that STEAM and computer science can really positively influence students' preparation for in-demand career pathways. So, you know, there's a lot of uh, great opportunities for em employment, even in the Northern uh, Virginia region, around uh, really important fields like artificial intelligence, cyber, uh, quantum information sciences, quantum computing, and getting more opportunities for students to develop, again, their interest in those areas early um, is really going to support us in helping students develop um, skills that would allow them to be successful for those in-demand uh, in career pathways in the future. So just one more uh, section that I'd like to mention, if I could get the slide to advance, and of course I can't. Maybe, they, maybe the clerks could help me just advance the slide to the next slide there. Are you able to advance the slides? No, he can't do it. All right, well, we'll work on that and I'll tell you about it. Um, and, and what I want to talk to you about is, 
you know, what are we doing for some of our student subgroups who need the most support, namely our English language learners, uh, students on IEPs and 504s, um, and then our uh, students that are economically disadvantaged. So um, those student subgroups, when we were looking at the data, continue to have some of the, the more challenging um, performance gaps that we really are trying to help them uh, close. So we're doing a lot of work in this area. And the first area that I would mention are things that our ESOL office is leading to really make sure that all of our schools are implementing our English language uh, programming with fidelity in all of our schools. That's really, really important. We have a strong program model. It's evidence-based, supported by research, but we need to make sure it's implemented with fidelity. So one of the things that we've done is this summer, all of our school-based administrators, principals, assistant principals, deans, all participated in required training to ensure that the division's uh, programming expectations for English language learners was clearly understood to start with. Um, and uh, we covered strategies uh, and provided resources to support students' um, access to English language development. So one of the things that we have created is a new L verification dashboard, which we're using to be able to track centrally um, how much English language development instruction students in all of our schools are actually receiving, and that's really, really important. Um, and we'll be on slide uh, 28 when, uh, when we can get that working again. Another big thing that the ESOL office is doing is school visits uh, that we're calling programming consultations, so multi-day visits in schools um, with the leadership teams in schools. We've done 20 of these uh, already so far. Uh, to really make sure that the schools, again, have the information that they need to, to implement our L program model with fidelity. Uh, thank you very much. Um, one of the things that we're really working on with those schools is making sure, again, that students are scheduled appropriately, have the additional supports and resources that they need to be successful, um, and that they really understand um, students' testing data. So the WIDA testing data provides a lot of really actionable information for classroom teachers about the strengths that students have as well as uh, the skills that students are developing and it can allow teachers to really modify and support their instruction when they understand that data well. Um, so the team is going to be meeting with all 200 of our schools to do those uh, in-depth consultations. Another big thing that we're doing is a new partnership with Project GLAD and the GLAD is just an acronym for Guided Language uh, Acquisition Design. And basically, it's just a model of teaching English language learners uh, in general education classrooms in particular. So how do we differentiate for English learners? How do we scaffold? How do we support them uh, with key strategies to help them access content um, that's not in their native language? So we've already had 300 teachers complete the two-day GLAD training workshop, and we're seeing some really good results uh, when we look at the data. Um, even this year from teachers who participated in that training, uh, they're often uh, achieving better results with their English learners than uh, teachers who have not participated in that training. And then another really important aspect is the work that we're doing around engagement with our uh, English learner families. So I think you know we've provided uh, some tools and resources to schools like um, the Talking Points app, which allows uh, teachers and families to exchange information uh, in their native language and it translates everything for them. So that really supports that two-way communication. And we also have a contract with the United Language Group, which uh, provides licensed interpreters uh, via telephone or Zoom uh, to facilitate conversations between parents and uh, school-based staff. So those are two things that we're continuing to do. But a new thing that we're expanding um, and piloting this year and will be expanding in future years um, is our Title I office is collaborating with family and school partnerships and the ESOL office to implement a new uh, family partnership symposium series. It's going to be at least a quarterly series um, to really focus on providing parents with the key information that they need uh, to support their students' success. We're going to be focusing on things, of course, like literacy and math. Uh, but there's going to be a whole component to the program to really hear from the parents what do they want to learn more about and what do you know they really need help with and we will tailor uh, the symposium series to really be based on uh, what it is that our families are telling us that they need and then another thing that we're doing again when resources are tight we have to be real strategic about the decisions that we make so we're really prioritizing um, teachers who work in Title I schools. We're prioritizing their access to a lot of our professional development and support that they're getting from central offices. And again, I think that's really important because they're working with some of our uh, most vulnerable students and, and they need to really be at the front of the line to get that additional support. 
And then lastly, in this section of cross-cutting strategies, um, I think the board is, is very familiar with the work that we're doing around our special education enhancement plan. Uh, we've continued to partner with our stakeholders, uh, teachers and community members to refine that plan this fall. And we're very excited uh, to start implementation of a lot of the strategies that we have in the plan. And, and one big strategy is around professional development and high leverage practices. So what are the key practices that we want all of our teachers to understand as they work with special populations in the general education setting? So one big thing that we're focused on is access to universal design for learning, or, or UDLPD. And UDL is, again, it's just a teaching approach that works to accommodate uh, the needs of students with different ability levels and create environments where, you know, all of our students can feel included and, and achieve success through different ways to access content and materials, different supports and resources, and different ways to demonstrate their learning. So we're looking forward to continuing the implementation of that work. And that was a lot of information. I apologize for that. But we wanted to give you at least a, a high enough level, um, but also some details about some of the existing work. And I'll turn it back over to Marcy uh, for some conclusions. So as we wrap up today's presentation, we would just want to offer um, some high-level conclusions and a few implications uh, for awareness. Um, FCBS has a foundation of success for us to build on to achieve our goals. And we have patterns of inequity that exist um, as students begin kindergarten with us that we're going to need to address to meet or exceed our goals. Um, the next goal report is um, pre-K, so it's a good sort of foreshadow into where we're going with this. Um, our work is gonna take place over several years and it's gonna require a lot of new learnings. You heard Dr. Presidio talk about some of the work we're already doing that's required teachers to learn new things and schools to learn new things and apply those new learnings. And so as Dr. Reed said, our, our use of time is gonna become very important as we um, move towards our strategic goals. We also need to think about, as a system, how we make sure those professional investments stay around, so thinking about the recruitment and retention of our, our teaching force um, and making sure that we're making good professional investments in their learning. And then finally, as a division, we'll be continuing to assess the, the resources and direct them to the strategies that are most effective in meeting our goals. So two next steps just for awareness. On November 20th, as I shared earlier, the board's going to um, vote on the, uh, at the regular meeting on the baseline report, and Dr. Reed will pre present an abbreviated presentation from today's um, work session. And then uh, Dr. Ponce and the Chief of Schools Office is gonna be scheduling meetings or has been scheduling meetings with board members to um, go through more a deeper dive into individual school and region-specific data. So at this time, I'll turn it back over to our meeting managers. All right, thank you so much. Um, we <clears throat> will start off with three minutes per board member. We will we'll reduce it for the second round, but I know this is the meat of what we do, so um, wanted to give people as much an opportunity, at least in the first go round. We assume you will want a go back. So, um, number one, we have Dr. Anderson. Thank you for already putting me down for a go back because there's a lot to digest here. Um, thank you. <laughs> uh, one of the things that I kind of wanted to orient myself is this is not as much as a goal report as it is as a current status report because I had envisioned something different than what is provided here. So I will work under that premise. Um, but before I go there, I'd like to ask Leedy to speak to the data that can be found on the page that I showed you earlier that showed the number of schools that have met the percentage points over the last three years because it is not what I anticipated it was and maybe others are having the same misunderstanding. Yeah, so thank you, Dr. Anderson. Stop and my time, stop my time. Okay. Not you, come on. Okay. I want to squeeze all those three minutes, okay. so I want those five seconds back. Um, you so were here first this morning, <laughs> so you probably get extra time anyway, right? Thank you. So um, thank you, Dr. Anderson. This, the question that you have is about a metric that's quite different from any that we've used before, but it's really critical to what we're trying to do. And it's because we are asking our schools to make five percentage point increases this year in where they started and where they're going to be by the end of the year. So that baseline about schools is trying to gauge how often were we able to do that in the recent past. And so it's looking, if we look at the three years, there were roughly 200 schools, roughly 600 times we're looking at. From year to year, were our schools able to raise 
what we're looking at, so reading by third grade or algebra one, any of those things, were they able to raise that by five percentage points within a year? Because that's what we're asking our schools to do this year. And so it gives us a baseline number of how often we were able to do it, and our schools were able to do it 36% of the time in the recent past. And that will help us next year as we look to see whether we really could expand that, because we want 100% of our schools being able to do this every year for us to make the kind of progress that we're hoping to make on all of these metrics. Thank you. Just a quick follow up to that. Why did we decide to use the three years that included the COVID year where a lot of schools didn't see that increase or were missing that data? Right. So all of our all of the schools that are included in this would have had some data in, in those years. Um, part of our, the look at the baseline is to try to get as stable a look as we can across the time period and lots of things often change. So yes, the COVID year here, um, we know that we had lower performance and maybe it was easier to make that five percentage point increase from year to year there. But we also know with some of our other metrics, it actually worked in the reverse. So we want it to be as stable as we could be. And also because over time, the kind of ramifications of that and what has stayed with our students continues to be something that we have to work within and, and try to help um, push our students along in terms of what might have happened during the COVID year. So we were just including it as what we're currently deal, dealing with, that um, schools have to help make that kind of progress even with the COVID year. So it was just kind of included in it to be, try to be as stable as possible across that time period. I think I, I don't agree that it is as stable as possible. I, I would have loved the opportunity to see some of the pre-COVID years be included because that would have provided what the how our division historically performs. But I will leave that there. Um, one of the other things that you have, well, there's a lot here, but there's a lot that talked about how some of the strategies is being embedded in the SIP plans, et cetera. I had the opportunity to review some of the SIP plans with both regions two and six. One of the things that I noticed and how they were articulated, there seems to be a misunderstanding over percentage points versus percentage. So for example, some of the SIP plans reflected, I was at 10% and now I'm at 15%. So that's the 5% percentage points that you all are talking about. But some of them were, I'm at 10% and they took 5% of that 10%. So the increase is 10.5. So that was kind of all over the place. So I'm wondering in terms of the guidance to the development of SIP plans in which we are putting a lot of eggs in that basket in order to articulate it at least correctly across the division, because I did not see that in my two regions. Uh, yes, uh, absolutely. That's why uh, we have been working with, with the races, very specific in the language and, and common language. This is what uh, we spent last week some time, and we have uh, sometimes tomorrow as well. Some um, meetings have been actually scheduled just for the RASIS and EPs to work on common language when we uh, see the SIPs, because we know that this is very important. Right, but some of these were already posted. I mean, for me, that plan is just like a template. You drop in your kind of kids, you drop in your timeline, you drop in the number. It's kind of all over the place and it's hard, I think, for the general public to um, really come to consensus in terms of what does it mean without going under and unpacking all of the other layers. It's there, it's just not convenient. But I don't wanna waste a lot of my time on that because I wanna jump into some other things. Um, one of the things that I would like to see in terms of the data, because I'm really looking into, you're looking for feedback from school board members, is how the data is presented. I, I appreciate a lot of the intersectionality. I appreciate the um, comparison to the state. I would love to see a comparison to our neighboring schools because we do this in budget, we do this for salaries, we do this in, all, in many other areas where we look at the Wavy schools because that's our closest competition. I, I would like to have um, that information to see how do we compare in these categories with Loudoun, Arlington, et cetera. Um, similarly, I didn't see any information here that talked about how our um, students were performing by gender. You mentioned about girls in, in math, but that was not here, if I can get a response to that. So the, the gender data is not included in this report. The gender data is going to be included in some of our upcoming reports. Um, so it's not specifically disaggregated in here, but if that's something the board has an interest in. Well, it gives us a chance to see 
how our kids are, and all the ways that they present. I've run out of time, but I have lots more. We assume so. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Anderson. I did want to just interject because you made a statement about what you expected. So I just want to remind everybody that can may perhaps be in your next steps. So just be mindful of that so that we can talk about that uh, moving forward. Okay, uh, number two is Ms. Uh, Tolan. Thank you. Um, thanks for the reports, lots and lots of information. Um, Dr. Reed, this is probably a question for you, and it's a little bit off the, this topic, but not really. As I read through this report, what kept hitting me over and over and over again is if we don't have the right teachers, enough teachers, trained teachers, we can't do it. So can you tell us a little bit about strategies just to make sure we get the best and the brightest teachers in our classrooms and that we keep our experienced teachers there? So great question. I think that um, we, uh, our HR department is working on their recruiting and hiring um, plans like right now. We're hiring people already this fall. Uh, really, we used to have a hiring season. I don't think that is the case any longer. We're hiring year round at this point. And I think that the work um, of our strategic plan is work that uh, educators want to be engaged in. So I think that the um, mission-driven content of that work is critical. I know that uh, Dr. Wilson shared that we actually had quite a large number of applicants last year and our ability to process them in a timely fashion I think contributed to at times not being able to complete the hiring cycle with um, eligible staff. So we're really working on that as a key performance indicator, a KPI, is that time from interview and application to the time of hiring. Uh, because we know hiring is different today uh, than it was 10 years ago. 10 years ago, I think here in Fairfax County, we probably had 50 candidates for every position. And now we've got, you know, 50 positions and few candidates. So we're really going to have to modify both our hiring timelines, our hiring um, speed, <laughs> and making sure that we are providing the supports once we have recruited staff so that we retain the staff that we do have. So I think all of those are very important. And I would ask Mr. Smith if you have anything you wanna add on that about our uh, work, because that's probably our highest priority. We're a people business and we want the absolute best educators for our students. Yeah, I would agree, and, and you're spot on when you're talking about that hiring timeline when we hire earlier we can start that process earlier. What we found in the past is that we've had a condensed window, so when all of the requests come in at one time, it can be difficult for HR to process those. So as we get our, our, our culture acculturated to uh, hiring earlier, we can process those more quickly. I also believe that there is, uh, on the back end, once we have those teachers here, that professional development is a very important part of that process. So ensuring that our teachers have the time uh, to actually learn how to support our students uh, differently and, and have the resources to do that will be very important for us moving forward. Okay, I'm just happy to hear you say it's the number one priority because I have to tell you, every principal that I've talked to and have visited recently, that's their biggest issue. It's the middle, or we're in the second quarter, and I think especially with some of the populations that we're looking at in here are schools that have higher percentages of L's or um, you know, students in poverty. Um, those are some of our most transient populations you know, some schools are burgeoning and they just need to get the right people in there or we're not gonna be able to do this. Um, that gets me to another question. We've done a pretty good job of like breaking out the, the students, but what about the schools? You know, and looking at, um, are our schools hitting 100%? Um, are, will we look at things like, you know, schools that have higher or lower percentages of um, English learners, schools that have higher migration, um, you know, schools, of course, we Title I schools, non-Title I schools, schools in those network um, improvement communities. I know across Herndon we've had with the, um, the language work on network improvement community that people are raving about and raving about the results. Um, I think Claire Silva and, you know, Ray and Lillette were working on that. You know, are we comparing schools that have those networks and don't have those networks? Those kinds of things. Uh, 
good morning, um, and thank you for that question. I think um, that's definitely something that um, is a really critical um, piece to um, addressing a lot of the uh, key questions that are coming up um, from this data. Um, moving forward as through some of the data tools that are uh, being developed that are aligned with the strategic plan, um, thinking about how we can identify those schools easily and quickly um, that are either performing um, above where we're expecting them to perform or below, and then trying to learn what is happening at those schools is, is something that um, is definitely going to be occurring. Um, there, that'll be happening in, in a couple different ways. Um, our uh, senior leadership team will be looking at um, kind of on a uh, a division wide what is happening with our school improvement plans and analyzing some of the things on on some of our quarterly uh, monitoring with them um, as our schools get to the end of quarter one or end of quarter two and complete their reflections show some of the interim data that'll give us some good indications as to how we're doing across schools and then we need to be able to um, uh, identify you know we used to have these compression and elevation charts that allow us to kind of see where um, where the strengths are and, and where are the places where we want to um, investigate a little bit more. So all those are being the data tools and the dashboards that are being developed with the strategic plan. Um, they're not there yet, but it'll allow us to have that type of analysis as we look at this information. Okay, great. Um, I, I was very excited to see AVID mentioned in here. Um, you know, uh, Longfellow Middle School is an example of a school, um, you know, in Drainsville that I don't think is a school that you normally would think of as um, being an avid user um, because it has a relatively small percentage of free and reduced meals. But they are, you know, using the avid concept across the school and with very good success. They're super excited about it. So um, I am not as familiar with um, avid being used for um, students with disabilities. Is that an area where? Uh, we could have some additional help for those students. So we, <clears throat> we use the AVID strategies and make those available to any teacher who's working with any student population in the schools right now. Um, some schools have more deeply embedded some of those school-wide practices, of course, than others. Um, but the strategies are, are helpful for any student population. Um, we have really tried to uh, partner with some of our special education teachers that have been teaching uh, courses like our Strategies for Success course um, for students with disabilities to make sure that those strategies can be used in that course or could be accessed by students outside of that course so students might not actually have to take that course but could get access to the strategies through advisory, through a learning seminar, through support in their other you know, courses that they're taking. Um, which would free up a course for students to take another elective or another course. So, you know, that's work that is happening, but it's work obviously that we need to expand more systematically. Okay, good to hear. I would like to see that expansion. Um, another quick question um, on the math in particular with the curriculum changes. Are, are you, do we have to work with VDOE on some of that? Um, and I noted that we talk about if kids are meeting their foundational skills by grade level, um, they should be able to accomplish algebra in eighth grade. But those grade level things point toward algebra in ninth grade. So how does that fit together? <clears throat> That's really the resequencing of the, of the curriculum, um, as I was trying to, to mention in taking some of the concepts and making sure that they're embedded at earlier grade levels in a way that you know, can be scaffolded over time. Um, we don't really need to work with the state. Obviously, the state has new math standards, and our standards are driven by state standards. But pretty much in all instances, the FCPS curriculum standards are slightly, you know, more than what um, is, you know, required at the state level. So we don't need state permission or anything for that. We just need the time for our curriculum teams to do that curriculum resequencing and writing. And so, you know, we typically try to do that work. Um, and over the summer and summer curriculum projects. So, you know, we won't get all of that done this year, but, you know, we'll get large chunks of that started this year. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Ms. Tolan. Uh, Ms. Corbis Sanders. Yes, thank you. And thank you for the presentation, but more importantly for the report, because I think there's a lot of data in the report that got masked by not being in the presentation. And so, Dr. Reed, I know you're going to be presenting this before we vote, and I would urge you that you take the um, chart on page four of the actual report 
um, with, and put it into the document or for presentation because that really does uh, show quite a bit of you know, where we are as a county and then where there are deltas in individual groups. Um, and I think that's a powerful chart. Uh, similarly, page uh, charts, tables 15, 18, 19, those are the charts that are actually in the report that shows the intersectionality that um, you highlighted um, in your presentation, but they actually, the actual data is important to present. Um, a particular, I would also say, and I would, I welcomed Ms. Tolan's comments about the disaggregation by school um, and the intersectionality of that disaggregated data by school, uh, because I think that too is something that is just critical for the public to understand and for each of us to understand, because that will keep the focus on the real thing, which is the focus on the success of our children. Um, and so I, I think that that's really important. The other thing that's missing here is the, um, you talk about, and that's what the tables 15, 18, 19, and I think there are a couple more where it shows what how we perform versus the state um, and the nation. And so I would suggest that it is critical for us to actually present that data um, because that's what people, when they look at us, want to see where we compare. And we are very happy to compare on our SAT scores about that. Well, we should also be doing that as well in this area. And there are some areas that we are not performing as well at the state level. And we have to be willing to accept and own that because that will then direct our resources. And so I would suggest that you know, especially where it says that um, uh, the FRM and the um, English language learner data is where we fall behind the state. And I think we need to be very intentional about making sure people understand that. I also want to offer a couple of suggestions. My daughter um, at Bellevue, which certainly was not a Title I school at the time, nor is it now, um, but all fifth and sixth graders were taught the AVID strategies and they were reinforced. So it really is something we should be doing at every one of our sc elementary schools. And at a minimum, every one of our elementary schools should have AVID it, for the Title I schools. I would also suggest as you're building out your, um, and I'm gonna need to go back, but I'll just finish my statement here. You're building out your um, family partnership symposium. I actually think that you should include AVID strategies as part of that symposium, because if you were to do that, then it gets reinforced at home, which is exactly what many of us do with our kids. But we were taught those strategies early on, so doing that in that format would be helpful. Please put me on and go back. I have some more. If, if I could point. just make one brief comment, because I think those were some great suggestions. I did want folks to know on your suggestion about um, AVID and elementary and Title I in particular, that we did get some supplemental funding in our Title I budget this year, and we will be expanding AVID to all of our Title I elementary schools. I didn't mention that in the report, because when I mentioned AVID, we were focused on advanced coursework in secondary schools, uh, but we are excited about that. So. Um, I think that's going to give us a real boost to get those uh, strategies really kind of implemented school-wide. But, you know, a lot of work still to do on it. So thank you for that suggestion. Would you suggest doing it for the parents, teaching the parents? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Ms. Corbett Sanders. At this point, we have everybody down for a go back. So just tell me if you don't want to go back. Okay. Ms. Sizemore-Heiser. Thank you. And... Um, Dr. Priscilla, I have a question for you. Do you know um, what it takes to pass a third grade VAP? Like what's the criteria to pass the third grade VAP? I don't know that uh, off the top of my head, but I could see if any of our subject matter experts do. Anybody know the criteria to pass a third grade reading VAP? What is required? I feel like I'm on a quiz show. I well, you that. are, because I'll have the answer for you in a second. Excellent. I like that. I like to phone a friend. But I figure as a, I figure as a chief academic officer, that's something you should know. Well, I, I don't know. I mean, there's an awful lot of assessments that we give. I don't know that off the top of my head I would know exactly the criteria for that one. But Anyone else know? Are we, we're talking about the VAP reading? Mm-hmm. 
it, I think it's on the VDOE website. It is on the VDOE um, website. Right. So there are three levels of the VAP, right? Advanced, intermediate, maybe developing, anyhow. Um, only like because you? you shared with me recently, Ms. Sizemore. Did I you this morning? Yes, you did share it with me this morning, but it's not really in the reading, anyhow. The, um, the, even at the advanced level for reading, it's being able to identify certain characters, words, and so forth, but it wouldn't necessarily be reading. Advanced. So. Given sentences read to the student or that the student reads, the student correctly identifies and understands the meaning of most words. Not sentences, words. So can you ask me how combining the data for reading in every single table for SOL VAP gives an accurate picture of students being able to read by themselves by third grade? Well, I don't know if anybody else from the team wants to to talk about how the decision was made to include those two and, and um, aggregate them together. Um, a very small percentage of our students, around 1% of our students, are accessing the VAP. So I wasn't part of the conversation to make the decision to include those uh, together. But I'm assuming, unless anybody else wants to speak to that, that the decision was to try to be as inclusive as possible with the student testing results. Then I think you would separate the data out, which I know after I made a phone call last night, we got this morning. However, and I know it's a small percentage, but you hide the growth in that percentage by subsuming them in the same number, and we don't have an accurate picture, 1% of not, who are actually reading by third grade. If we subsume a test together, it's like putting the AP test and the SAT together and saying, look at our AP pass rate. It's not the same test. It's not doesn't demonstrate reading by third grade. And what's disappointing to me is I've mentioned this for four years. I've described what the VAP is for four years. I'm looking at the VDOE website, and I would think somebody would know what the, VD, what the VAP actually tests. I think it's important to show growth for the VAP students. I absolutely, we should include that data as separate, and it's a small number. It may not change the number, but by subsuming it within that number, you don't really have a separate data point for growth on the VAP, which may or may not indicate reading by third grade, which is a civil right data point you're looking for. So Ms. Sizemore-Heiser, I, I will own this because I know you have mentioned this for the last, at least since I've been here. So I, we do as a team need to be more attentive to uh, when we talk about each and every student, um, that's each and every student. And clearly we didn't hit the mark here, so my apologies. And the team will work on that prior to our uh, presentation at the board meeting. Thank you. And I, I'll just say, look, I know we want all of our, the goal is to figure out which kids are reading by third grade because it's an important data point. The goal is to figure out which students are ready for algebra by eighth grade. We need to use our metrics that actually demonstrate whether we're meeting that goal or not. So I'll just leave it at that. Um, another question about the algebra by eighth grade. One of the things for math, I'm sure you all know this better than I do, right, is to make sure the students have all of the foundational skills right, to be successful in algebra by eighth grade. However, the metric seems to be a C minus to be success, and I worry that a C minus might mean that there's some foundational skills missing that may or may not set students up for success in eighth grade. So just out of curiosity, how was C minus selected as that metric, as that successful metric? So um, the C minus, it's actually in the past, so a ver the verified credit, actually, a student would get the verified credit even without a C minus. So what we're basically doing is students below that who could still get a verified credit were not counting. So it's more stringent than actually getting the verified credit. And we were trying to respond to what we have heard in the past about when we went with just um, anything above an F was considered success. We were trying to get to a different point with it while simultaneously um, counting students who in general get the verified credit and not removing too many of them from it. But simultaneously, um, 
very few of our students who are getting that verified credit are getting the C minus. Um, especially in eighth grade, very often students expunge if they're, they're getting a low grade. And those students, when they're expunging, are not counted in this percentage. And so they're actually being removed from it as well. So it, um, we could get you a breakdown of exactly what the grades were, but there are very few that are getting a C or a C minus and being counted in this group. I appreciate that. I guess my question was more towards the grades before they get into seventh or eighth grade, right? When you're building those foundational skills in elementary school, right, when we're looking at data, you know, math by third grade, we need to look at beyond a C minus to make sure they have all those foundational skills to be successful. And then the last question I, I know is um, when we look at advanced coursework, you, you talk about CT and IB, AP, but I believe our conversations also included advanced arts in that. And that doesn't, I don't know why that wasn't in that metric about advanced arts as part of advanced coursework. I know my time's up. If anyone wants to comment on that, I'd appreciate it. I know that we tackle our arts um, coursework in goal four, so I know that that metric is forthcoming as well. I guess I just would want to know why it's not included in advanced coursework. Thank you, Ms. Oh, you um, so Ms. Corbett, or Ms. Uh, Sizemore-Heiser, I am not entirely sure why, but we certainly can include it because it is, um, we can include it in both reports because I think we did actually adjust uh, transcript waiting also for the advanced uh, courses in the arts. So um, is that correct, Sloan? Yeah, that, that's correct. Um, okay. And again, <laughs> I mean, these are all good comments and suggestions. This is the first baseline report. So, you know, we can adjust any of the things that the, the body of the board would like us to do. Um, I think the thinking on the advanced coursework, again, I'm you know, was not involved in a lot of conversation around this, was courses that are equivalent of college credit, right? So a student could earn college credit for AP, IB, or dual enrollment. I think that was the thinking with the advanced coursework. So not cor okay. not necessarily courses. Ms. Not Ms. Saying Ms. Sizemore right Heiser, decision. did you want to discuss that on your go back? Just what, we don't get college credit for CTE. Okay. Uh, well, okay. All right. Thank you, Ms. Sizemore Heiser. Uh, may I suggest, uh, with respect to the definition, perhaps include some of that in the next steps? I, I think I saw a number of nods in the room. Um, Ms. Bakarski. Okay. Um, good morning, afternoon. Thank you, almost afternoon. Thank you um, for the report. I, I, along the lines of what Ms. Tolan brought up um, with the teachers, that, that was what struck me as well, and in particular, mm -hmm how often we saw professional development, professional mm -hmm. development, which obviously is necessary. Um, but at the same time, we have a lot of professional development. So are we restructuring some, when, when are we gonna fit all of this in? And I, I, so I'm, what is your thinking around that? When is this gonna happen so it's effective, not overwhelming? Uh, Ms. Pekarski, thanks for the question, because I think as we look at our calendar and our opportunities for how we're pulling for teachers for professional learning, that those are limited times and opportunities. We are in the process of pulling together a committee that's going to be looking at strategic professional development and how we align and use our time. Um, we have a number of ways of how we deliver professional learning. We have models where we pull teachers out to provide that professional learning. We have job-embedded professional learning that we provide. Um, turnaround training, so we're going to have to, as we think about these priorities, think about that that commodity of time and what we're, what is most important and what is what we're going to be able to accomplish during the school day um, and summer professional learning, those types of things. So we have a team that's going to be coming together to look at that. Okay, yeah, I mean, I, I think that's important because something is going to have to be um, changed. I, I, I don't know how people can do all the things. Ms. Um, Pekarski, Dr. Reed would like oh, to Oh, sorry, Dr. Reed. Thanks, totally Ms. Keesmore. Yeah, no, I just, I want to remind us when we went back to that chart that said that we're only really focused on three pieces right now of goal three, to your question, that's why, right? Like, because if you think of all the things we can develop, implement, and monitor in any given year, Everyone only has a finite capacity. It's not even, you know what I'm saying, like it's time. So I think there were some questions about why did we pick just those few things when there's so many measurements. Partly, um, this is that phasing chart on the screen, but partly because we cannot provide professional development for all those things at the same time with the same people. It's just not, yeah. it's not possible. It's like throwing 10 life rings to someone who's drowning, right? Like it's yeah. not gonna be helpful, so thanks.
I agree, um, and I had another question regarding why we picked some of those, but I'll, I'll save that for a minute. But I guess my point was more towards we have to look at everything holistically. Something's got to fall off the plate because we can't, and there's the request. Anyway, okay, I think you get the point. Um, where are we in terms of professional development in particular for our early literacy practices? I know we were slowly rolling those out. Yeah, so the, and I'll see if Noel wants to add anything on this, but the main things that we were highlighting were around the letters training, the Orton-Gillingham training, and again, we've done a lot of training in those two areas. And then with targeted professional development around our new basal resource that we're going to adopt this year. So that's really kind of been the focus of um, centralized professional development. There's a lot of additional professional development that, you know, leaders, literacy leaders in the building, instructional coaches that provide support um, to classroom teachers. But I don't know if you want to add anything to that, Noel. Okay. So my, my question was specifically, where are we in that in terms of the school, like across the schools, are we halfway to well, we getting? Have we have 1,500 teachers trained right. in letters, 2,000 okay. in Orton Gillingham. So you can kind of do the math okay. on that. Okay, yep, that was my question. 10,000 okay. elementary teachers, right? And we're kind of That's where we're at. That's the question. At, so. Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah, thank you. That, that answers um, my question. Um, jumping to Algebra 1, I think we you talked a little bit about open enrollment and how that was hopefully, you know, taking a barrier out for folks, but then we haven't seen that increase of kids enrolling. And I, I have, I'm sure you do, and I do have some educated guesses as to why that is, but uh, personal experience and what I've, I've heard from parents is that um, kids want to take these courses, they go into these courses, they are not then getting that support they need, and they are encouraged to drop that class and try something that's a little bit easier. So um, I think that needs to be considered in, in this because we are not gonna see kids successful if we don't change, I think, mindset, provide support, because the teachers need it too. They can't do all the things. Um, so I guess, I don't know if you have any comments around that or how you, you see that factoring into this. Because it's, I mean, this is going to be a big lift. Yeah, I mean, I, I think you're right. I mean, the, and Dr. Hunter's in, in the room, um, and you might remember her kind of speaking at the board meeting back in October about some of the root causes that, you know, the schools that are engaged in the, in the network and improvement community are finding. And, you know, a lot of it is around student beliefs about whether or not the class is going to be too hard, if they can be successful or not. So, you know, the teams are working a lot of those uh, issues. But as you mentioned, w once a student gets into the class, we still need to do everything possible to support them to be successful, right? We don't want to, you know, just be changing schedules. So, you know, we are trying to provide more tutoring support for students uh, in our schools right now. Uh, we're working with teachers to really make sure that, you know, they have high leverage strategies that they can use to support students to be successful in those classes. So there is a lot of additional work that we need to do to provide the supports to students in the class. So that's a huge piece of it for sure. Yeah, yeah. I, I think it's tutoring, but I think a lot of these kids need mentors mm -hmm. within the school to help them, um, and I think it's going to be crucial if we if we really want to see that um, going up. And I was actually floored by the fifty one percent that verified credit yeah. statistic that you said, and then when you said twenty four, <laughs> I was like, oh my gosh, we've got real serious problems nationally. And that anyway, that just. That just floored me. I also had a question about the C minus. I'm not sure I'm really comprehending that as why we are picking it. So I want to put that out there. Um, seems like a low bar, especially with your answer that most kids do much better than that. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I, I will just leave it at that. I, I'm not really understanding that very well. My thank, last, thank you, oh, Ms. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> okay, I'll go back. We, we, we've got you on a go back. Ms. Omesh? Yeah, um, I'm actually happy to follow this, and I'm going to build on some of that. So, um, But, I mean, I do appreciate, it's obvious a lot of time went into this, the data analysis piece. I appreciate seeing an improved version of this where there's more depth and detail. Um, I guess my first question before I start is um, we obviously had conversations with the strategic planning piece of like what data points will be important. You all then refined what exactly we're going to be looking at. How did you come to identifying these pieces?
So is, there is some description in the report itself around how the measures were developed, but they were developed, um, both ORSI provided some methodological sort of support and advice on a starting point, then they were vetted typically through our content um, folks in central office, and then it was shared back with the, the leadership team as well to make sure that we were honing in on the most critical things in the measures that were shared. And there, um, we were also trying to make sure that what was included in the metrics really comprehensively um, touched upon each of the parts of the measures that were in there because they were often um, very specific things that the board had asked for and we wanted to make sure that we were um, staying true to what you had requested by looking across everything that had been included in it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Were there any that were considered but not included? I would, I would, that, that's, um, over the course of this, obviously we were getting feedback, we were getting input, certainly the starting point for it is, was not the end point of it, and so there were ones that were definitely considered along the way, or tweaked along the way, or changed along the way, so um, most definitely in all the cases of the metric development, there's been you know improvement over time as everybody provided their input and their feedback on what might work best in terms of providing useful data points um, that have centrally collected data we could report on or had the possibility of creating centrally reported data that we could report on. Yeah, I think that's helpful to know, mostly because I think we're trying to be transformative and probably relying on what's already been measured, what's already existed, isn't necessarily gonna do that for us. Um, you know, I'm taking this just like Dr. Anderson, where this is a progress, or like a status report, right? I am not, which is great, because then that means we could change things, but Dr. Reed, like Ms. Pekarski and those who were before me, I feel pretty strongly that this is not what it's gonna be, and it's actually really disappointing and shocking that the data is as bad as it is with these metrics, because I guess what really gets me in all of this is, I wanna think of this as like, if this was my kid, like what would I consider to be successful? It's definitely not just barely passing the SOL and just barely graduating and getting like a D average. That's not, I'm not proud of, it. like, I mean, there's always growth and whatnot, so I don't wanna <laughs> generalize, but like that is not our star student. Uh, and, and, and the quantitative only goes so far, but if, and any, none of us here would accept that for our kid. We would be thinking, let me invest in tutors and like find all the solutions and it's urgent and it's like important and we would have to do something about it. So I, like Dr. Reed, one of the things that I remember we spoke quite a bit about when you first came on was the fact that, you know, in your old district, you all didn't do that, right? You looked at how many actually were achieving at a certain, le like a higher level or like, um, graduation wasn't good enough, right? So what what happened here? Like, I, I, I this is definitely not going to be the transformative work I think that we're looking for um, in terms of what we're measuring. And yeah, so I just want to understand where the disconnect was. Yeah, I think as we look at a baseline for data, um, I don't know if we again some of this work has been been has been worked on for a couple of years, right? The algebra in eighth grade work, I think, has been um, a goal for quite a little while here. I don't know when it began, Sloan, what year, but it's been it more than a couple. It was in the previous strategic plan. It was prior to the pandemic even, right? So I don't know, in looking at that data, to me, what was really important is to draw a line from where we are today to that above 90%. <laughs> because right now it feels like we're just kind of spinning on some of the strategies to get there. And we need to get very intentional and move forward with specific strategies and supports that on a finite number of measurements, right, we can't do everything every year because then nothing is getting attended to. But what we've tried to do in this report is take three really very specific um, points and exert the full measure of our um, resources, our alignment within the organization to make sure that within goal three, this work um, actually gets moved this year. Because it, I would say to your point, has not moved in a way that we would feel satisfied over the last, I don't know, eight years, seven years, however long it's been, you know, a goal. But I think when it's a goal that's one of um, lots and lots of goals, it's not gonna get the attention and focus it needs. Yeah, I mean, it's revelatory that it's like this bad with the bare minimum. So, 
that's one thing, and then focusing our attentions on that. But then can we look at them side by side or at least internally identify that this is temporary? You know, like these well, are metrics we're focused sure. on now. Because my, w w the way I'm receiving this is, you know, after the strategic planning, staff identified what the metrics are, right. and this is how we're moving forward forever. Like this is... Yeah. It might be a good time for me to draw a little bit just to explain kind of what that looks like if you I don't know where in the meeting that would make sense meeting managers but kind of just to make sure we understand that we can't develop every strategy or implement every strategy for every goal in the same year like we have to and I could draw that out if that's helpful and also take a look at what what we mean when we talk about closing an achievement gap um, because uh, I think there's some really specific uh, data metrics that we haven't necessarily looked at here that we need to be really clear about. Um, and the whole division needs to be very clear about it. Like it, I think goal three, these three things, I, you would be hard pressed to find anyone that hasn't heard us talk about those three, right? So this is like every arrow moving right there on those three right now. But I'm happy to um, kind of draw that out at some point, maybe later, maybe now, whatever seems to make sense for you. Yeah, I mean, I think I'd like to see maybe like an addition somewhere to this where we explain that. We say, okay, until blank year, month, whatever, this is what we're going to be laser focused on. Here are the future pieces that we would like to, and that could mean creating metrics. Maybe it's not something that exists that Lady has in her back pocket, right? But like, because, yeah, I want to see kids performing at a B plus or higher level or whatever it is, right? Like, You're right. I think we have to be explicit, and mm -hmm. that's keeping us honest internally as well. I cannot believe that's my time, <laughs> but I was I was trying to smile <laughs> at you. <laughs> yeah, I'll take the go back, obviously. <laughs> All right, thank you, Ms. Omesh. Dr. Reed, maybe what she's asking you for is a type of next step, right, uh, in response to the questions that have come forward in this meeting. Just maybe consider it that way, okay? Um, Let's see, I think we have Ms. Omish, uh, Ms. McLaughlin. Uh, okay, so I'm being told that the next steps have been emailed. Is that correct, Madam Clark? Okay. Yes, they Thank have you. Been. All right, so uh, that, that's an important step for us, obviously, in this meeting. This is really the, this is where the rubber meets the road, Ms. McLaughlin, I'm sure. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Thank you, um, Dr. Reed. I'm gonna start at the macro level. Um, I do appreciate what others have said that this is probably one of the better reports I've experienced during my tenure in terms of bringing some of the, the, the data and metrics and start of analysis that I would hope to see from the division. Um, my frustration that I came and spoke to you earlier about and I, I, I'm so upset that I'm trying to keep my voice at a measured um, pace. I can't understand why we still struggle to help educate the board and the public and the division on what intersectional data means. It's not in, these, in this PowerPoint. It should have been at the start of this presentation we will never move off of putting children into singular buckets and help the public really understand what we're grappling with if we don't start there. So once again, we have people in a, in a one-dimensional bucket. We do it first starting by race, and then we have in its own bucket poverty, in its own bucket ELL, and yet where we have our subgroups by race that are struggling the greatest. They're disproportionately in the buckets of poverty, ELL, and if we had those up there, we would start to talk about what is the challenge we're facing and then how do we develop effective ways to help kids. So if we just don't start there, then the narrative becomes, well, based on race, this is how you're going to be successful in Fairfax County Schools. And that's just not only a deeply harmful message, but it's just simply untrue. So that's, that's been a, a boiling point for me sitting here. Um, the other thing that I want to echo is we've been talking about this since I joined the board as well, more than a decade. 
are we shooting low or are we shooting high? And so, Abrar, you and other colleagues absolutely captured it best. What does a high-performing school division expect for all of its students? And some of these metrics are extremely low. And this school division, when I first joined it, used to talk about our just Virginia SOL pass rates. Not pass advanced, because that wasn't pretty. And no one wanted to see those numbers, um, again, broken out and disaggregated. But it all matters. The final thing I'll say in my 22 seconds is, super excited about the Orton-Gillingham training, really disappointed that it was under Dr. Garza's tenure that our Decoding Dyslexia of Virginia parents lobbied for that. Yep. So that goes back to like 2013, 2014. Uh, so, you know, I feel like we're a little late to the game here and it kind of, it, it saddens me and I'm sure for all those children who could have benefited so many years ago. And I know I've run out of time, um, so I'll pick up on the whole thing about AVID as well. Thank you, Ms. McLaughlin. No. I, I would it? like an answer about why, through countless uh, presentations over uh, countless years, we didn't profile the intersectional data today. So it, is there anybody that would like to provide a response to Ms. McLaughlin before we go to the next person? I think we would agree, Ms. McLaughlin, it's an important point, and we'll make sure it's included in Monday's presentation. Ms. Koufax? All right. So happy to follow all of my colleagues, um, with Ms. McLaughlin being the last uh, speaker. As Ms. McLaughlin said, some of these things we have been battling for years. Um, I look around the room, some old faces, some new faces. I know you all work hard, and I don't want to disparage your work, but we do need to come to get, because I know you work hard, and I don't want to, um, it's, it's not one thing, one person. It's collectively where we are as a society, as a system. Um, but we have to be real, Dr. Reed. That's what we have to do. Like you said, we've got to stop spinning um, because we have been spinning for a while. So I will get to some of my questions as quickly as I can. Um, let's talk about algebra by eighth grade. Um, we start in the elementary school where we are not consistent. We are not consistent in advanced academic resource centers. We are not consistent in, with, with, with teachers. And I guess I would stop and ask a question, where are we in recruiting the best and brightest math teachers? I, I, I know that's, that, that's where it begins. So I can say our recruitment efforts, we work very closely with colleges and universities across the country uh, and specifically have conversations with them where we see uh, our, our greatest deficits. Uh, we send uh, recruitment teams to those schools to uh, bring those, uh, those best and brightest teachers back to us. Um, but again, it, it's really about the relationships that we have with colleges and universities, and we stay actively engaged based on uh, trying to bring those critical need positions to Fairfax County. And I appreciate that answer. I think what we need then is to look, um, Mr. Smith, at once we hire who we think are the best and the brightest is to go through and ensure that they are teaching at consistent curricula across our elementary schools, the, whether it's a, a, an advanced math or regular math in order to meet our goals. So the second thing I will ask is, um, you know, we heard last year during the budget session, we, we were successful in bringing advanced academic resource teachers to all of the elementary schools, and we heard an outcry um, from our teachers in middle school who want advanced academic resource teachers there. Dr. Presidio, is that something you would support in next year's budget to my colleagues who are going to be here next year? We're at 0.5. I'm, I'm we're at 0.5, with, I'm yeah. I'm just double checking with Noel, but we're at 0.5 at all middle schools yes. right now, right? Yeah. So you're saying to increase that to one. To one. I mean, because we've heard that pretty loudly and strongly, and I, I'm just wondering, would that help if children are self-selecting and they need help, and will that help them as they move up and on in trying to stay in those classes or even 
with um, making certain that when they self-identify, they are in the right place because we don't want them to be in a place where they're not going to be successful. I mean, I'm, I definitely think that that would be beneficial in a number of instances, even beyond the ones that you've mentioned. Right. Um, again, I mean, I think it's going to be, you know, it's always difficult to figure out what are the, the priorities. priorities for the board. But, yeah, absolutely, we would support that. Yes, 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 yes. Um, okay. Um, I think um, also, so with my 32 seconds, I'm going to try to get a quick question in to Dr. Ponce. Um, Dr. Ponce, um, when, where are we on page 28, where are we in reviewing our programs to ensure that all schools are implementing ELL um, programming with fidelity? I'm going to start on that one, and then Dr. Ponce can help because, I mean, we do have a partnership, obviously, with the Office of School Support working with Dr. Ponce now. But as I was trying to mention, we've gone through 20 schools so far, um, really the ones that, you know, we're prioritizing schools that have large numbers of English language learners. And it doesn't mean that every school is not important, but we've done 20 of those ESOL consultations, so there's quite a few still to go. Uh, but those are multi-day, you know, sessions with the leadership teams in schools. So it is, does take quite a bit of time mm -hmm. to get through all of those. But we're working together to make sure that we can prioritize the staff and um, the chief of schools office as well as the ESOL office uh, on my team to, to get as many people out there and do them as quickly as we can. Yeah, and I'm going to add that um, we have been working side by side with um, Mr. Polio and the RASIS and this time because the part of this, um, I believe, is uh, um, that at one point, the data was not actually um, showing. Like you said, um, uh, we were looking just at genetic, just on uh, general. And the time that uh, we had that conversation is we're going to start dissecting in this exactly in the way that we are right now, um, looking at the whole division, then by region, and then by um, schools, and by teachers. This is the only way that we're going to start moving that is dissecting, because uh, I agree with several comments that I have heard is we talk in general, and we will never be able to move if we talk in general, because uh, everybody learns a different way. And when we look at exemplars as well, something that we want to find is, okay, uh, if we look at the whole di division, uh, we will not be able to actually go exactly to, oh, Ponce need this kind of help, because we don't want to generalize. And this is exactly what we are uh, in the field, probably before this quarter end, um, I will be having a, a report for all the board members and very specific with that. Uh, something that I'm trying to build is, um, uh, is a, a data how I'm going to be uh, showing uh, the EL, very specific. So you will be able to compare by areas and by schools, actually, and by pyramids, because it's very important that we see that uh, some pyramids are ahead of the other ones, and we don't want that. We want to make sure that we are talking about Fair fact. Fair fact is a 90% means every single one, not only one school or the other, but every single one receiving that can uh, that different level of support. Because uh, what we're going to start and we started already is actually uh, prescribing exactly what they need. Because not every single EL needs reading. Some of them are really ahead of reading, but they need speaking or listening or writing. And that's how we are going to start actually improving. If we can move that, we're going to move um, the whole di division and be above. Because I know for EL, we are below across the state. Yes, uh, thank you. I, I think that's an excellent strategy. And 
uh, Dr. Reed's over there, but I think that also could be something that, um, that same, a similar strategy could be used with the math students in trying to get them to get to that level that they need to algebra because I, I believe we are not, we are generalizing and we are uncertain of what is before us because we have been spinning as um, several of us have noted. So my time is up. Put me on for the go back. Thank you, Ms. Dernat Koufax. Mr. Frisch. Thank you. Um, I want to focus on algebra by eighth grade as well. Um, it was stated that participation has increased to 64% through current efforts from what? From 57. It's like 56 or 57. Okay, so we're at 51% um, with adequate completion at 56, 57% of participation. So we've probably already met our goal for the year? No, because our goal is on successful completion with that C minus or higher and the verified credit. So I was just trying to make the point in that comment that with just a small subset of schools just working with one strategy around academic advising, we're starting to see some good growth in terms of the number of students that are enrolling. Um, but to some of the earlier comments, we still need to make sure that those students are successful after they enroll in the class. So there's, there's still a lot of work to do there. Okay. Yeah. So we've increased enrollment by almost 10 points or eight points or so um, since last year. Okay. Um, the report talks about um, a drop off between kindergarten and second grade and in, in, it blames the screener or the, the lack of fidelity between screeners. What are we doing to address that? I think it's hard to move forward without clear data or at least reliable data that is the same from school to school. Uh, are we doing anything to straighten out um, where we're getting the screener information from? That's an excellent question. It's really complicated. And I don't know, Noel, if you want to weigh in on this one at all or not, but um, we actually are moving to some new screening instruments, um, partly due in part to some changes at the state level with state uh, required screeners. Um, and we don't have that all 100% confirmed yet in terms of exactly what that's going to look like. But I don't know, Noel, if you want to add anything to that. Yeah, good morning, everyone, or perhaps it's afternoon. Sorry, it's afternoon. Um, we are looking at the, in the reading, in the reading venue that come fall, we will be changing our screener. So we'll be moving away from iReady and using a state screener. So we are expecting that there will be, we use a state screener for kindergarten. So we're expecting that we will start to be, have something that we can look at more longitudinal data as we use the state screener for kindergarten, first grade, second grade, and so on. So hopefully we'll be able to make, um, you know, better interpretation of that data. For math, it's not as, um, we're not as clear when the state if and when they might be coming out with a screener. So we'll still sort of have that, that changeover from K to one, but we certainly can look at that data from one to three um, to see where we need to improve. Thank you. Um, I get leery whenever I see a big jump in numbers in, in the report. And so we have this jump from 50% to 68% from third to fifth grade, and then a big jump to sixth grade at 68%. It seems like a bit of an outlier. Can, can you all explain why? Let me see exactly where I'm, I'm, I'm pulling it up. This is uh, page 29. It says baseline data indicate that from third to fifth grade, the percent of students who met the benchmark was a little over 50% which followed a similar pattern to the first to second grade benchmark performance. There was a fairly large leap in sixth grade where 68% of all students who took the spring mathematics screener in sixth grade as elementary students met the benchmark. That seems like a pretty huge jump. Yeah, so I don't know off the top of my head exactly either. So I'm looking at the team and I see folks that are looking at the report. So Dr. Hunter, Noel, I'm not sure if you have any comments. If not, we can follow up with, with you offline on that. And we might need to take a little bit closer look at that one. Yeah, let us take a little bit closer look. I mean, we can typically explain that that um, decline in fifth grade because we know our fifth grade advanced students don't take the fifth grade test, and that's that year of change. For the screener, I'm not sure how that plays out, how we categorize those students. So I need to do a little bit of investigation, but we'll definitely get back to you, Mr. Frisch. Thanks. Speaking of fifth graders, um, 
the, the report talks about how there's probably more room for growth with our fifth graders who are not taking the advanced, uh, who are not taking advanced math and thus taking the sixth grade SOL. Um, can you speak specifically as to why, uh, what might be done there um, to assist them? Well, I hate to put Dr. Hunter on the spot, but she did come to the work session and she's leading all of our efforts around math. So maybe we could invite her up to the uh, And I ask that because table. it seems like the yeah. ones taking advanced would be most primed for algebra and the ones that are going to need the most focused support are going to be the ones not taking advanced. Right. right. Hello. Good afternoon. Amy Hunter, K-12 math coordinator. Um, so I, you, you bring up a really good point. I think that it really underscores that right now our advanced math program prepares students for Algebra 1 and eight, Grade 8. What we need to do is ensure that our standard level program does that, and that's where the opportunities lie. And so we're looking at an option of compacting curriculum to ensure that our standard level coursework prepares students for Algebra 1. So I think when we do that, we'll automatically see um, potentially an increase in screener data because as mentioned before with sixth grade they are getting exposed if you're in six if you're in fifth advance or sixth advance you're getting exposed to more content so the screener data would capture that because screener data is not based on the co content that you're getting in class it's exposure to a breadth of content, you know, uh, it's more comprehensive so I think we could see we could measure increase in fifth grade based on more exposure to content in fifth grade through the compacting. Thank you. Um, it might be useful in future iterations of this work to know when we're looking at data what types of initiatives are moving specific segments of the community because it's at a certain point we're going to be trying so many different things it might all get muddled together. To that end we're nearing the halfway point of the school year and we have a goal of 56 percent completion uh, or adequate completion. Um, one of the things that you've instituted, Superintendent uh, Reed, is a variety of dashboards that you're monitoring uh, for very specific metrics um, that indicate future success. Are we doing anything comparable to measure for this type of academic success so that we're not finding ourselves at the end of a cycle, end of a year, um, wondering you know, if we'd only course corrected six months earlier, we might have hit our goal or exceeded our goal? So great question. And <clears throat> I think one of the things, um, I know that we're working hard on number one is re envisioning Orsi's role in this work as well, right? Not to provide simply summative data, but to provide formative data that can be actionable in real time. And it's not unlike a school based response to intervention where you're constantly monitoring. And the reason you monitor is to adjust. So I think what we are trying to do is tighten our cycles of monitoring so that we can adjust. So that is the purpose of the dashboard. I think we also, the team has taken a look at what are the leading indicators. In other words, what should we be tracking earlier to make sure that we have the right supports in place to reach the targets we want? And I think, uh, Dr. Presidio, do you wanna comment on what we chose as some of those leading indicators or uh, Ms. Neal, one or the other of you? So oh, I don't. I don't know that I'll get them all correct, so Dr. Hunter could certainly help me, but we're looking at performance. When you look at eighth grade math, right, we're looking at performance, obviously, in math on standardized assessments in the earlier years. We're looking at the courses that students have taken. We're looking at some of our um, uh, progress monitoring assessments, right, and all of those are the types of leading indicators that we're looking at for pretty much all of these measures that um, we've discussed. So as Dr. Reed said, we're not just looking at this as like a summative you know, autopsy report at the end of the year. We're looking at that programmatically, but more importantly, I would say the schools are looking at their own data, right? So the schools are meeting in quarterly review sessions to look at where they're at in their current performance data. Um, and we're providing additional support to, you know, help them refine strategies, uh, intensify strategies that might be working, try new strategies when things haven't been working. Um, and, and that's where the change is going to happen, right? It's got to happen in the classroom, and schools have to be really well versed in where their data is, uh, both on these outcome measures, but also on the leading indicators. So I, I think that's probably one of the strategies that, you know, we're trying to lean into the most is the supporting schools and reviewing their data formatively as, as frequently as possible. Thank you, Mr. Frisch. Uh, okay, colleagues, this is the time we're supposed to stop for lunch, but we are. Let there be light. Um, okay, so 
So uh, we have a choice. We only have two more people on this round. If we have, without objection, if we could finish this one round, and then uh, we will come back and we will have two minute rounds for everyone, if that's okay. All right, Ms. Marin. So my big takeaways from this is when a subgroups are enrolled, they tend to perform well. But subgroups are often not enrolled, like when we're talking about the math and the CTE, rather. But when subgroups are not enrolled, that's, that's a straight up access issue. And even when a substantial amount of growth is achieved by a subgroup, it isn't enough to meet proficiency on the SOL. So like those are like some bright spots that like our students when given access can do it, but because of the helpful way you explain difference between a screener and an SOL, I saw that even though our kids might make growth, they might not meet that proficiency and there's the whole you know, source of things about why SOLs can't capture ability. The screeners mask progress. So screeners mask the challenges, but the students can pass the SOL because they're more global, except for what I just said about screeners. Uh, tests can be um, discriminatory in some ways. So those are just like my big picture when I think about how are our students doing. Um, I love that you uh, teased out the 504, students that have a 504, because so often they get subsumed in with students who have an individualized education plan. Okay. About the grading, so the conversation so far just underscores my ongoing concern that we don't have a clear grading policy. And so I understand you know, why the C- minus was chosen, but Dr. Reed, I'd like to ask that we very, as soon as possible, update our policy 3003 um, and the regulation 3004, I think it was um, done in 2020. Uh, so that's regard, wait, hold on a second, back up. That was regard, I'm rushing. Okay, one point is the grading, we need to update our policy on grading. The other policy is the policy on um, instructional materials. Okay, so actually we don't have a policy on grading that is current. Instructional materials, that policy is 3003, and the regulation is 3004. But it doesn't say how often basal materials should be acquired, so I think that needs to go in so we never have this much of a disruption again. Um, I'm also wondering if the state has given the funding it promised to go with the approved basal resources. One big thing, just in general, is about the teacher's training. I think it would be helpful to include it here. When you say numbers like 1,500 teachers have been trained for letters and 2,000 have been trained in Orton Gillingham, well, what percentage of that is the teachers that we need? And someone may have said this. But, um, and when will that training happen? Because I've heard teachers say they really want it, but it gets crowded out. So that's a whole other time thing. Um, jumping around here, honors. Honors, APIB. What are the criteria for an honors level class? What is the quality that makes it an honors level class? I also want to know, um, regarding AP or IB, there was a, a, a piece that says, um, let me just finish this thought, students were counted if they participated in an AP or IB course and the numerator is when if they passed the associate exam, but I think it's important to tease out which students took the exam and failed and which students who didn't sign up for them at all, because that's a linkage. So that's all I can do right now. Yeah, so that's just for consideration, but I got some more. Do do we have any uh, responses? I hope somebody took some notes there. Well, I got them all here. Okay. Anybody want to comment? Okay. All right. So um, it's my turn. Thank you. All right. So I, I um, first of all, want to thank uh, you guys for this report. I know we went through a lot of discussion um, just in preparation, I didn't expect metrics because uh, I think initially we were told that wasn't going to be a part of this discussion. So I want to talk a little bit about what I think may be already baked in, right? And for example, we see that with Abbott, right? We know that where we have Abbott, where we uh, expect young people to participate in certain classes, expect them and prepare them, for example, for algebra, that they actually do that. And, and the problem is that it's been baked in 
that they don't get it unless we give them Avid. And so I understand that we're trying to expand it, but I would expect, given what I think I heard here today, that those principals would try to help root out those that, that baked-in barrier to students who aren't going to do well unless they have that level of support. So I want to start there, and I don't, um, Dr. Presidio, if you want to give some comments with respect to how we can achieve that or whether you think that's necessary, I'm, I'm open. Stop my clock, please. Well, you'll have to maybe help me um, a little bit if I'm on the wrong track here. I would say, so AVID in the secondary school um, kind of has two components to it, if you will. One component is the students that are getting kind of the full experience and they're in the AVID course, which is a tutorial course. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's one of their you know eight courses that they take. They come to it on a regular basis. Um, they learn strategies there, but they also get support from their peers and from the uh, tutors in the classroom. And then the other component is the more universal school-wide component where we take some of those strategies, whether they're note-taking strategies, test preparation strategies, right? Um, and we try to, you know, uh, infuse those school-wide so that all students uh, can benefit from applying those strategies. Um, so there's really kind of those two components. The students who actually have that tutorial section, though, as part of their schedule, obviously are getting significantly more support than just a student who maybe has been taught a strategy and maybe that strategy is being reinforced in their classes with uh, their classroom teachers or maybe it's not. So there is kind of a wide variety of, of supports um, when we talk about AVID. So I guess my concern is that since I've been on this board, I've been looking at the same results. Part of my conversation in discussing this was this isn't new information. When I just looked at this and there were no metrics at this report, the, the great takeaway was that we have achievement gaps. That's not information. But I think we're asking why. Why do we keep getting the same results? And when I hear that students who typically would be in that achievement gap area receive AVID and we overcome some of that, then that's baked in, mm -hmm. right? And we have a tool to address what is baked in. So I guess what I'm looking for is not just the status report of, yes, we have these achievement gaps, but I'm, I'm thinking there are some outcomes that have been historical, and I think that they have actually been opportunity gaps. And I'd like specific uh, strategies on how to address that, and I'm wondering if AVID is one of them. I, I think AVID, at that full end of the continuum that I described, definitely we, you know, and I, I mentioned a couple data points is showing really good success for, for at-risk students. It's incredibly expensive, right? We're staffing that at really low class size ratios. Um, and, you know, we've been able to expand it to 28 middle and, and high schools now. But there's students even in each of those 28 high schools that could still benefit from a tutorial course like that, right? Um, it is incredibly, you know, costly to be able to do that. So it's a strategy that we have good evidence and data to suggest that it's working. And it's one of those things that I think when we have really difficult financial decisions to make that we can invest in expanding it because it has a track record of success. But, you know, we don't have the resources to expand that universally, you know, just in one budget year. I, I get that. I guess what I'm asking for is can we get creative where it doesn't necessarily involve a class, right, but we're, we're implementing some of those strategies, and perhaps that's a next step because we do know these things have been baked in. Yeah. The other thing that I'm concerned about is the extent to which our teachers are feeling overwhelmed with this transition. Are we, have we talked to them with respect to, oh, okay, and I know I'm all for the goal of 5%. However, what does that look like in various schools? And I'm also concerned about what the fidelity tools are to make sure that what's happening in this school over here is actually happening here. And, you know, I know we have the same goal, but who's monitoring to make sure that we're using the same tools and we're dealing with the same baked in stuff that has been a concern and been giving me heartburn for at least, I don't know, since my children were born. So thank you, Ms. Keyes-Gamar. I think one of the things that we took a major step um, last week on was the looking at the school support structure um, in that department. We currently have been providing, I think, uh, Dr. Ponce, we have 30, give me those numbers again. 
we had uh, 38 schools that were receiving support, but now we had a uh, 108. Right. So it, historically, we've had in the 30s of schools that are receiving that really direct support. Support now we're over a hundred schools, and when you th that require that direct support, that's a <laughs> three time uh, increase. Uh, we can't keep the same structure and provide the targeted support that our schools and our staff will need. I also think when we think about something like Avid and uh, Dr. Presidio is correct, we're going to need to be creative. If we just talk wicker strategies, and that's all we integrate. That's good for every child, right? That's executive functioning skills. Every student uh, would benefit from that. Having said that, it looks very different at elementary than it does at secondary. And so when we think about how, um, and the data points that we have to wrestle with right now for accreditation, the CCCRI data, which really kind of no one's been in charge of because it's a brand new data point. Um, the tutoring that all in Virginia has allowed us now to um, have some more money, although granted not uh, sufficient to meet all of the tutoring needs, but it's it's a help, but that's a whole, I mean, we have several hundred tutors that we didn't have a year ago, right, to manage, which also connects to the early literacy work that I think we've talked about today. So I think restructuring and making that work uh, more strategic because we've evolved to a place where we need it to be. Accreditation rules are changing um, in the Commonwealth in the coming uh, session. So we have a lot of things to tee up. And I think the more we align and narrow our intentional focus, we're going to see different results. And to your point, I think it's also an expectation, a mindset that we have that not all children are capable of some of the work we're talking about. And I believe that our commitment and our strategic plan that our community has spoken and said they do believe that each and every student has that right to have equity and access and excellence. And I, that's, I don't think that's a mind shift, but it's going to be a behavior shift for some of our processes. Um, but I'm really proud of our teachers and our principals and the work that they've undertaken this year. And when you look at our school SIP plans, that's a major step towards recognizing how important that is. Because if the work is really just about saying, I think you can really, I think you could do well in that class. If that's the work for some students, and I believe that is, then that's work we can certainly be uh, undertaking. Lots of work ahead. Thank you, Dr. Reed. Um, we're going to lunch, you guys. How much time can we? Mm -mm. We, we, we need more than 15 minutes, so um, so can we can we go to 115? Is that okay with everybody? Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. If we could um, finish up our next half of, of two-minute rounds. want to make sure everybody, we, we had as much time as we could in the first round. The second round will be two minutes per person. You can trade if you want. All right. Do we have... <laughs> Why are you looking at me? Okay, I think we have three, seven. We're gonna we're gonna just go back and start from the top because everybody asked for a go back. And number one was Dr. Anderson. Yes, thank you. I'm gonna jump in on slide 21 where you were talking about to support the algebra work. You are going to increase the STEAM and STEM work. Um, we have several schools who have STEAM and STEM. Some of them have dedicated teachers. What, are we, what have we seen as the impact of that? And what data do you have to show that this is a, something that we need to um, invest in? So this uh, particular recommendation or strategy that I was talking about here was embedding 
um, computer science and STEAM concepts into the math curriculum, not necessarily creating any new positions at school. So it's about creating greater curricular access projects um, uh, into the math curriculum to help with some of the abstract algebraic thinking. No, I think I got that, but I kind of want to couch it into the things that we're doing that sure. we are expanding. How do we know that they are having the impact that we want? Well, I mean, there's there's research that suggests that some of the same concepts from computer science, whether it's sequencing, and again, I'm not the expert in this, and if Dr. Hunter wants to add anything, I'd certainly welcome her to do it, but that those are things that can correlate with preparing students for, you know, algebraic uh, thinking. Um, so again, we haven't tried this yet. This is like future work that we're planning on doing over the summer is to embed more of those concepts into the curriculum. <laughs> I hate to keep pushing, but we do have some schools that do have that. Are we using their data to see the correlation before we invest across the schools, division? Yeah, we have schools that have like a STEAM lab, right, and a STEAM resource teacher. Um, but that's a separate curriculum from our math curriculum. So that's a kind of a separate program. So to your question, you know, have we measured the impact of those programs at the division level um, in terms of like student success rates? We've not done any formal uh, program evaluations or studies on that. Kind of thinking about how much resource do we have, both human capital and um, financial, that's the piece that I would love to see. Like, what are the things that are having the impact? And we've measured it, so we know we should continue to invest there. I would also like to hear, since you have some of the new strategies here, what are we no longer doing? Hmm. Well, that's a good question. I'm going to look at the panel of subject matter experts, and I don't know if any of my colleagues. If we have could any run down each of these three areas of reading, algebra, and advanced well, in reading, we're, we're not doing a lot of things, right? And Noelle's got the microphone, so I'll, I'll let her jump in. But yeah, we've made a we've let go of a lot of things in reading for sure. Yeah, thank you for that question, and I'll certainly call on my colleagues if I'm if I'm not fully um, articulating. I think everyone is aware that the, in reading, it is is just a 180 shift, right? Moving away from our balanced literacy um, to practices that are aligned with the the research. Um, the science-based research. So there's a big shift in what we are and aren't doing. Um, all eggs are in that basket as far as preparing for that basal resource. In mathematics, I don't, when you, when you say what are we not doing, um, I think we are taking a new look at the way that we are preparing um, students or uh, as we will prepare students over the next five years. The state has just recently come out with new standards, so we need to make shifts to our programs of studies at every grade level. And while we are doing that, we are looking at that compacting that Dr. Hunter spoke up so that we can make sure that students have the access to the curriculum that will prepare them for grade eight um, algebra. So those two things are happening, and so it's a shift from focusing on what we have been doing to these new um, uh, curriculum pathways, so to speak. In addition, I would say um, with the mathematics, with the math teachers um, uh, that was brought up earlier, the, the whole ANIC, the idea of this network improvement community, it's, it's multifaceted, right? Because as has been said at this table, we could put all the eighth graders in algebra tomorrow and we'd be done, we've met the goal, but that doesn't mean that the teachers are ready, that the students are ready, and that there would be success. So we are spending time and having the teachers really get to that root cause of what, you know, what is it that we will need to do to ensure success in Algebra One? What are the scaffolds, what are the supports, what are the enrichments um, for students who need them? So, so that work is happening. I don't think it's a, a, an issue of what we're not doing with the teachers. This is definitely the ANIC was something we hadn't really been attending to um, and that the schools are coming to that work um, as, a new, as a new effort. Um, the, strategies, the strategies for course taking patterns, I don't know if there's anything that I would say that we've stopped doing. I think we're trying to put more attention um, and increase our um, fidelity to academic and career planning. Um, that's been there, but we're just trying to intensify it and increase our fidelity. Okay, um, you talked about the ANIC. Um, and looking at some of these data, it shows that our English learners are performing the worst in Algebra 1. Are we having the cohorts in the schools where we have the bulk of our English learners? So because I know last time we talked about being self-selected. Yes. Being selecting yourselves may not necessarily meet the goals in ensuring targeted interventions. So 
yes, the schools were self-selected because when we started this, we this project, we were actually under a different strategic plan. So, um, and I'll just name that the schools that we have, like Key is one of our schools, high population of, of English learners. So of the schools that we have, we have a pretty good representation of those who have pop strong and high populations of English learners. And we've pushed the schools that are participating to focus on the groups that need the most attention. And so I feel like because they're focusing on the groups that need the most attention, many of them are focusing on their subgroup, which would specifically be students who are English learners or students with disabilities. And again, they're focusing first on ensuring enrollment and then success in the class. Because it is a little bit of a, it's, it, you can't do both at the same time necessarily. You have to make sure students are in the class first. And we have seen an improvement in the enrollment of students who are English learners in particular at the schools that focused on that. Just not district wide. I'm gonna spend the last of my 20 seconds to talk about the goal setting. I appreciate some of the comments that were made about the 5% over the course of the next few years in order to achieve the 90%. And I also read in the main report that there'll be some years that that will have to be increased. There's a chart right there. But I also wanna name that there are gonna be some years where the increase is significant in order to reach that 90% by 2030. By 2030. We can't do 555 five, five, and then all of a sudden do 25. So there has to be a recognition of how reasonable is that? Or is 5% not aggressive enough to meet the urgency in some of these um, categories where students are underperforming? Like for the first few years here, it looks like we're just going to continue the achievement gap. We're just moving it, not closing it. So I really wanted to make sure that there's some realistic expectations regarding what it's going to look like in the out years. Because if we are, let's take the ELL Ms. and algebra, oh, so it's Anderson. my time. Okay. I, if I could yeah. just finish one sentence. I, you had a lot of grace, but oh. you can go ahead and finish the sentence. Just go ahead. I just want to give the example of the EL students in seven years at 5%, they'll only still be at 42. What does this mean in 20? 29. Are we going to say 50% is the goal? Thank you. So thank you, Dr. Anderson. If in this graph, and it's kind of hard to see that how much the slope changes, but um, the outer years here, we, we have set it for five percentage points this first year to allow us to put things in place. But the intention is absolutely next year to think about what is really needed to start shifting some of the groups more than other groups. And so in the example that's there, that lowest performing group actually needs to go up nine percentage points each year in order to hit it. So the intent is not 5%, 5%, 5%, and then all of a sudden we need to do 40. It's um, to try to start changing in the second year what the percentage points are for different groups so that we can actually start moving them faster and hit the target for all of them within the seven years. So you're right on target in saying we can't just do five percentage points every year. Thank you. No, because you got an extra minute and a half. Okay. Ms. Tolan, did you want to go back? I do. Please. Go ahead. Um, and I'm going to follow up on your question, so maybe I'll get your thing answered. Um, I was looking at page five and six, and I wanted to give you guys maybe an opportunity to talk a little bit about like what this process looks like big picture, because this is our first one. Right, we're just starting with goal three because of the academic content, but it's the baseline goal three report. I'm guessing a year from now it'll be the year one goal three report, and then the year two goal three report for seven years, right? And it does state in here that you picked 5% right now just because it's the smallest amount of performance improvement that will demonstrate any statistically meaningful effect. That's the only re the reason why we have 5%. But then each year, it could be whatever percentage, right, you determine it is necessary. Can you talk about that process that you'll be going through and with these goals and what happens in the next year and the next year? So as we begin our implementation work, there were a lot of structures we needed to put in place, a lot of systems, um, which is why we have a smaller effect size in year one. The whole division has to start to shift in a different direction and begin that alignment work. So we think about even the timing of adopting a new strategic plan. Um, a lot of the professional learning, things like that for the summer was planned 
prior to that strategic plan being adopted, you, we have to keep track of what's happening in terms of state changes, how we're seeing this data move. So there are a lot of inputs that will go into our sort of annual plan, how we set annual priorities. So this is these are year one priorities. Many of these may remain our priorities for next year as well as we see where our data is moving, um, the types of strategies and the work we're gonna need to accomplish to increase performance. Um, we'll have a series of monitoring that's happening at the school level with our SIPs, but also centrally, and Dr. Wright alluded to that, coming together as a central leadership team to look at the data, what strategies we're seeing are promising, things that are moving the needle, where we're going to need to do additional work, and then setting those um, targets annually based on the um, outcomes for each year. So the annual report for the board is going to show the progress from the baseline each year. So hopefully that answered your question. No, that is helpful just to try to see how this report fits in. And then um, I'm also, just as a board member, trying to figure out on Monday at the meeting, I'm supposed to vote for this report. Um, and so in my interpretation, I guess, of the vote is, am I saying, yes, this is the baseline for goal three at this point in time. I've got this data. Um, you know, is that a sufficient baseline? Like I know I, for example, put into um, next steps, you know, trying to pull apart some of the information on the various schools. Like I don't expect that to be done by Monday. I'm kind of expecting that to be as part of as you're looking over the next year at all of these academic items. You know, some of these items on this list, including mine. So can you just tell me what, like the Monday, it's my interpretation of what I'm voting for on Monday, correct? Yes, your interpretation is accurate. It's whether or not to accept the baseline report as our starting report with our data. And then certainly if there are additional needs that the board has beyond that vote, we can also work um, with the board to accomplish those as well. Okay, thank you. Not sure what I can do in four seconds, so. <laughs> We appreciate your restraint. I just, well, <laughs> the only thing I want to point out is pyramid collaboration, I think is going to be really important on all of this. And I know you, you mentioned it briefly. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Corbett Sanders. Yes, thank you. Um, I appreciate that this is a snapshot in time and the time that we are. But actually, many of these metrics, we had bridging the achievement gap with clearly defined metrics under the last um, strategic plan. And so I would like to have better understood with those metrics, where did we move the dial or was that just wasted time? And if so, then what are we doing differently to ensure that we don't repeat the same problem? Stop my time, please. I lost three seconds of I think, let me make sure I'm understanding your question, Ms. Corbett Sanders. Is it in looking at our previous strategic plan and sort of those final goal reports that were presented, what were our learnings, what were the things that were working well, where are the areas we want to continue to invest our work in? Essentially, yes. We want, I want to understand because we had clear numbers. We said we are going to bridge the achievement gap this much by this time. We're going to raise these metrics by this much this time. And so we seem to have just thrown that out. I think, <clears throat> I think, Ms. Corbett Sanders, if we take like one topic, the algebra in eighth grade, I know when I came in last year, I think we had the goal report that reported on that. And I think we'd kind of slid back a little bit on that data point, if I'm remembering. Like coming out of COVID just weren't quite as, you know, I mean, I think coming out of COVID, all of these plans took a bit of a hit, right? Because we just had to adjust so quickly. So a year ago, which would have been two years ago's work, I'm trying to be thoughtful here about this, um, we slid back a little on the algebra in eighth grade. This past year, we stepped up again by what, 7%? So we turned it around and are now moving back in the direction we should be. But so it's not like we've abandon that work, but what we are realizing is that we're going to have to approach that work very intentionally um, and at every middle school um, across the division or every K-8 uh, grade span for us to make the progress at scale. Because one of the things that we, I think, um, one of the reasons this particular strategic plan is critical is we need to not 
Um, we can't just look at pilot programs around the division. We're going to have to, as we've talked about before, pilot and then pilot, have a proof of concept and bring it to scale. And it's when it comes to scale, hopefully we've weeded out strategies that are not effective, to Dr. Anderson's point, if steam labs aren't moving the dial on that, then that's probably not our next best move for that topic. It may be for a different topic, but it may not be for algebra in eighth grade. Um, but we'll know then what has to come to scale to make sure, and there will still be some um, students that require more support and some less support to meet that minimum expectation. So I don't think we've done away with that data, but what we've looked at it, and made some shifts, and I feel like this past year, we are moving back in the correct direction. I think moved more than 5% this past year. So, so you've we've proven, got a ways to go, though. You've proven my point, Dr. Reed. Oh, good. There has to be something in this plan and in this presentation that says, you know, we've recognized these are our lessons learned, and this is where we, we are say, keeping and preserving certain best practices, and this is where we're letting some go. Because it just seems like we're looking for a new, you know, a new shiny penny versus being the thoughtful, intentful people that I know you are. And so if you could add to your presentation that, it would be important. Sure, and I, we could create, um, I could create a quick diagram to explain that if you want. You can, can even do, do bullets, quick? I don't care, but something that recognizes it. Um, secondly, we have in this report, um, we've talked a lot about um, success by eighth grade in algebra, and only 7% of our English language learners are doing that. So we also know that um, we, in instill confidence in children in their learning ability by doing certain things in their native tongue. Math tends to be a native tongue uh, subject matter that can be very helpful to give confidence. So I would like to understand, have you thought about that? Have you, what did you learn? I know you sent a whole bunch of people down to Houston last week. What did we learn in that process? Um, and then finally, what are we doing to um, maybe do more in native tongue? I would also suggest that the CTE area where we are behind would be another area with some of the, a couple of select courses that could be done in Spanish. I would agree. I think uh, mathematics is a language, right? So um, I know that one of the things that staff discovered in Houston, I think Dr. King and I actually had a conversation about this, was some of their end of course exams were able to be given in their native language. Um, I don't believe Virginia allows that. Um, so it puts us in a little bit of a different space. However, there are curricular designs supporting uh, our language learners. There's actual curriculum, right, that has less um, language and more um, mathematical uh, numeracy work. So I think um, all of those are plausible. I don't know if you want to add something, Sloan, on that, or um, Dr. Hunter, either way, Dr. Presidio. Yeah. I I was just going to check and see, Rich. I don't know. You were leaning in a little bit, and you led the, the visit to Houston yeah, sure. for FCPS. So I don't know if you want to add anything or not. Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I, I agree with, I think I agree with everyone on this. We, we did see uh, in Houston last week, we did see a number of classrooms that used uh, students' home language to, uh, to present content. And so I think we could start doing that here in Fairfax County Public Schools. The logistics have to be right, so we have to, you know, check with certain schools, work with, uh, it would have to be, um, you have to have a, obviously the same language in the in the set in that section of class in order to do it. Um, and as Dr. Reed said, we don't give Virginia does not give final exams, you know, the, uh, end of course exams in uh, languages other than English right now. But in order for to help students learn content, um, it seems to be working. So I think it's something that we just need to look at. I I don't believe we would start this division wide, but it's something for us to discuss. And and as I said, we. You know, we, we have a debrief with Dr. Reed, the whole team, um, next week. So we'll be, you know, I'm sure that'll come up. So if you could share. We already do. We do uh, home language support in for SLIFE students in elementary and secondary in the language arts area. So in content areas, we haven't uh, gone that far just yet. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ms. 
for Ms. Corbett Sanders. Number four is Ms. Sizemore Heiser. Thank you, and I want to um, lift up, I think, a couple things that I think Ms. Tolan mentioned, but really the importance of the metrics, right? Because these are this report is that baseline metrics that going forward for till 2030 we'll be using to measure progress, right? And it's sort of what we fund is what our values are, what we measure is what we, right? And so that's why I'm, I'm hitting so home on what are the metrics we're using. I really appreciate the use of screeners, right? And I appreciate that Mr. Frisch brought up making sure our screeners are consistent from year to year. I think that's important. Um, I think it's really important to also lift up uh, one of the things in our strategic plan Closing gaps was incredibly important, and I'm glad that we're really focused on that. But what is our growth metrics for everybody? Right? I don't want to lose that concept as well. Right? I, I love what we had here, which is here's sort of our plan, and here's our target as her plan on speed for those with the greatest gaps. And I like that sort of um, dual way of looking at it. But I, outside of access to advanced coursework, I don't know if I see any metrics that really demonstrate growth for everybody. So I don't know if, what, if you want to mention that. Maybe I missed it. It was quite a dense report. So if there's a place I missed, please let me know. So I think the intention with this is that the, all three of these areas are for everybody because we're not necessarily there with all our students and in many cases not with any of our student groups currently where we would like to be at 90%. So in that sense, I think that for definitely for the reading by third grade and for the algebra one, um, that we really are focused on all of our students in those. That may be a little less true with the advanced coursework CTE finisher, that there are some groups that are already sort of in that success zone of 90%. The other metrics as well that are in the appendix also speak very much to all of our students and how we're doing in different areas. So we were tr intending to capture all students. I think this the priorities are trying to really focus on where, sh where should we be doing our work with all of our students right now, and that, shift, that may shift over time over the seven-year period, but I don't think there was an intention not to be focused on all of our students. No, no, 100%, and I, I agree with that. I just, if this is our baseline for seven years, I feel like there needs to be a little bit more. I, I understand that not all of our students as an aggregate are, are achieving these, but there are individuals who are. And so I just am curious what those measures would be, unless there's a plan to update our metrics going forward in you know, subsequent years. I don't know, but I feel like maybe there's a, a gap here in those metrics. I don't, Doctor, if you have any comments on that. Well, I think what we don't want to do is close achievement gaps by having our highest performing students perform less high, right? That isn't the intent of this work. So I think what we're talking about, let me just draw this real quick. Uh, what we're talking about is a standard we expect every student to get to. Um,
Yeah, and, and you know, I want to lift up, it's very urgent that we close these gaps. I'm not trying to say that, but if this is our strategic plan metrics, I think we need to have that and. Right, and that's what I feel like I'm not seeing the and as much. Um, so I'll just leave that as where it is in terms of metrics, right? Okay. Um, but that was my, one of my questions. And then I know um, Ms. Bukarski mentioned the questions of our teachers, but I wanted to lift up that you know, if we're adding these, when are we looking really holistically at all, the, at all the expectations and what of our expectations are in alignment with this plan and these metrics and what maybe is not, so we're just not adding on to our, our teachers' goals. And I see my time is up, so if we have time for another go back, I have like five more questions, but I'll leave it at that. Are you asking about the intersectionality between the executive expectations and the goals, or no? I'm just asking about the, when we're talking about this algebra network and things, which are great strategies, what are we doing to look holistically at everything we're expecting our teachers to do, let's say, oh, over sure. the last 10 years, initiatives, and which ones are in alignment with this and which ones may not be? So we're not just adding on to their plates. Point taken. Still need that go back. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, We'll try. We're scheduled to wrap this up at 2.15, so let's see what we can get through. Um, okay, Ms. Sizemore Heiser, I'm looking for Ms. Pekarski is not here. So Ms. Omesh. Yeah, thank you. Um, I have more to share on the metrics. I'll, I'll hold that for now. But I guess I'm trying to think, okay, so we have the quantitative data that we're looking at. There's also, obviously, the qualitative, which is important. And... Um, you mentioned with AVID, for example, right? Like one of those successful programs that have led people to take advanced coursework and whatnot. Well, okay, what are the features of AVID? You have closer small group attention. You have mentorship for the kids, right? Like, so why don't we think of where that can be incorporated? And I don't, to me, a number of these solutions or strategies is like professional development and like things that have been done. We're gonna adjust the curriculum. Yeah, there need to be curriculum adjustments, sure. but. Again, if we're looking for that transformative piece, because when I see these numbers, I'm looking at just like pages 17 and 18, uh, 28 when it comes to reading and math meeting benchmarks. We're well below across groups, like where we're supposed to be. And then I'm like, okay, if we haven't met the benchmarks, are we at least getting kids closer to that? It, similarly, like pages 30, 31, and then 33, overwhelmingly, like 50% or less are showing growth, right? So, so again, I think if we're really trying to fix this within a seven year period, like we have to think of something that's just different, that's more individualized, that's, that's um, thinking about this in a way that's not same old as has been done because even, even in these benchmarks, like if you look year after year, it gets worse. <laughs> so then it's like, what are we actually doing here? Because a kid is coming off at a better place than they're ending up. Um, so long story short, I, I, I know this has come up repeatedly. It's a best practice in other divisions that have done it successfully, like individualized learning plans. Why are we not moving in that direction? I, it's just such an obvious thing. Like meet a kid by name and by need, it's trite at this point. Like what are we actually, you know, how are we knowing what is, you know, Charlie need and like a Malcolm need and like all the various kids, seriously, like and then measuring their progress. So I don't know, why have we not made that like strategy number one on this? I, you know, I, I'm not sure at, at what point that was discussed. Um, the individualized plan, I'm getting a no, it wasn't. I also want to be sensitive um, to educator workload issues at this time. What I think will be, what I think is very interesting, and I think we're going to see some examples at the forum that's coming up um, on AI, is that there's some tremendous possibilities uh, for personalized tutoring plans uh, that aren't necessarily personalized educational plans, but personalized tutoring plans that involve AI, AI platforms, which, um, and I know Ms. Pekarski and Ms. Tolan have brought AI forward as a forum topic. So Gotham Sethi and the Ignite IT uh, summer event, there were some really intriguing, um, I think, ideas that we can bring to bear within the next couple of years. It's not going to be seven years out. I think it's going to be the next couple of years. It's not going to be this year, but it's going to be, I think, a game changer for students. So to your point, um, do I think it's possible for a teacher at secondary that sees 152 students? Probably not. 
Um, but AI can be a support in ways that we're going to have to explore as a division. Okay, and, and I know that's uh, my time. Uh, yeah, yes. yeah. I, I was just going to say, I don't see how that's not a key component of this plan. Like that, if we're going to do it, let's do it now, and let's make it something we're tracking. Seriously. All right, that's it. Um, thank you. I never say I haven't done anything for you. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, thank you, Ms. Darnett Kovacs. Just love to see. She was number, I lost my track messing with uh, a bar. Ms. Yes, Ms. McLaughlin. I'm, I'm going to find you on the list eventually. Ms. McLaughlin. So I, I'd like to pick up on something else that we know um, about how we assess um, our students, I believe, by second grade. So have we um, disaggregated and analyzed the data by level designation? So we have level four learners, level three, level two, level one, and seeing where they are on the algebra by eighth grade. And stop my time. So you're talking about AAP level of service, four, three, two, and one? To clarify my question without the timer going, the, the, level, the level designations, whether it's for advanced ed instruction or not, it follows the kids and that's how they are designated. So have we done the analysis? Because even if you stay at your base school, you're still a level three kid or you're a level two kid or a level one kid. So it's something we've determined about their giftedness and have we disaggregated by levels where those kids are or not accessing algebra by eighth grade? I don't know, and I'll see if anybody on the team thinks differently. I don't think we've done that in a while. Um, a number of years ago, we had done something similar to that just to look at levels of preparedness. But I don't think we've done that in, in quite a while. And the reason I was asking for clarification is we also have WIDA levels one through four. So I wasn't sure, you know, which group you were talking about. And we have done the same thing for our English learners based on their WIDA scores. And, you know, when you look at the performance of students that are level three or level four, it's quite different than the performance of students who are levels one and two. So to your point, looking at that level designation and that intersectionality, <laughs> right, like we've been talking about, and a lot of this is really important because you can't just say all English learners or all AAP students or all students, right? Um, that intersectionality piece of the analysis is really important. So my follow-up question would be, if we haven't done it, why haven't we done it since these kids all have that designation and we use that designation based on this belief that we've effectively assessed them at the second grade on their gifted aptitudes? Well, that level, that level of service for AAP, even though we haven't done this analysis in a while, which we certainly can, can do that, um, I think what what we'll find based on looking at this previously is it's not really the level of service designation that a student has, it's really whether or not they've been accessing advanced math, right? Um, because that correlation with advanced math and success for algebra one by eighth grade is really, really strong. Um, so that's probably the data point that's, that's most impactful is, and this again gets back to the compacting of the curriculum and trying to get more of those concepts you know, if a student isn't qualified for advanced math and we're trying to get, you know, as many kids uh, exposure as are ready to, to do that, um, they would still have access to some of those foundational concepts in fifth, sixth, and seventh grade. Um, so that's probably when you look at by level, um, it's probably going to be actually whether or not they participated in advanced math. So colleagues, I'm sorry Dr. Reed isn't in the room, but you are, so I'll just maybe refine why I'm asking this question. It's not because I am so fixated on our AAP students by any stretch. It is something that we do in this school division and label kids. And I was in my own family watching my two older sons get lab labeled level three. The, old, the youngest one lab labeled level four. It became a family dynamic in it. Um, it was on the playground all the time. And the irony is the level three boys in my household had just as high, <laughs> exceptionally high SATs and GPAs and advanced scores on the AP exam. So it was a meaningless label. And, but it's to me, I'm asking the question because I believe it is a chronic problem with this school division. 
we do these things where we assess, evaluate, label kids, and then we don't even test to see if our labeling and our categorizing is even accurate. So I asked the question, I really appreciate your honesty, Dr. Presidio, and we unfortunately don't have time to really unpack all of this, but I was using it as just as a micro level example on the macro level efforts of this school division. Don't go around assessing and testing kids and labeling them in the second grade on where we think they are in giftedness, and then we didn't even measure to find out were we accurate by the time they hit high school or even in middle school. And so this really wasn't about AAP at all, but it's about what we are doing as a division and are we really checking our, our programs, our efforts, our assessments, because if we're not, then I don't know how we're effectively serving the kids. I think, I think those are all excellent points, but since we kind of opened the Pandora's box, I, I do want to respond just a little bit, Pandora's box being AAP here. So again, I, you know, sitting here today, I don't know what recent analysis we've run. Um, we do check to see how students in AAP levels of service are performing at different um, points in time over their educational experience on different metrics. We used to include that information in the old strategic plan report. We've not done that in this baseline report. So if that's something that the board would like us to do, it's something that we definitely should do. Um, so that might be something for you to consider. And the other thing I would say is I, I totally appreciate all, all the comments and points you're making. I, I do want to point out that we are required to test, and there are state regulations and guidelines that we have to follow to identify students who need an accelerated curriculum. Um, and, th and that is what we're doing, and that is why we're doing it. And I definitely apologize when people feel like they're feeling labeled, because that is not our intent at all. The levels of service one through four is actually an intent to try to not label a student as AAP or not AAP so that all students are getting some level of service, right? So if that's working counterproductively, then those are things that we definitely need to have more conversations about. But I did just want to point out, um, we try hard not to label kids. We do have a legal requirement to identify kids who need an accelerated curriculum. Um, so I'll just leave it. Yeah, there. I know my time's up. I believe you, but I will tell you what educators said to me about my own kids was harmful and inaccurate. Thanks, Ms. McClellan. Oh, and, and I definitely apologize for that because that is certainly not what we want to have happening anywhere in the system. So, yeah. No, thank you. I believe Mr. Frisch is next. Did you want to go back? Yes, thank you. Um, I want to talk a little bit about how we arrived at the 5% uh, goal um, because there has been some conversation about whether that is bold enough. And my question is, it seems logical that it would be easier to hit bigger goals early on and harder to hit bigger goals later on as our options for moving people uh, along the continuum become fewer. How do we, you know, how do we make sure that we are not sh shooting too low in this first year? I think it's a great question, Mr. Fresh. And <clears throat> I think as we were thinking sort of that hockey stick mindset of growth that you got to start in some ways as you're shifting the division into a new way of doing work to sort of go slow and setting up those systems and structures and getting the shifts that you may need in curriculum and in content and, and how schools are setting their goals and monitoring their goals, how the division is addressing their goals. Um, department plans is a great example. This is new work for the division. In some areas, we've got departments who have provided, done their own annual improvement plans. In some of our departments, setting K KPIs is new work for them. So we're setting those structures up so that we can accelerate our progress year after year. So that five, five percentage increase in year one is really to allow for some time for the division to make those shifts so that we can be much more successful in accelerating that growth the next year. And if I could just add to that, and I, I don't think I've done a very good job of kind of explaining the work, at least in terms of the content that I presented, because we're, we're getting a lot of really good suggestions. Well, did you think about this? And how come you didn't think about that? And all of those um, points will help us refine our work. And I don't think I've done a good job explaining. We haven't built out like a new set of strategies, right? This is the baseline report that we've just started working on. 
We haven't done our department improvement plans yet. We're doing those in December. We haven't formed our goal teams, and it's the goal teams that will look at all of the research, think about things that we've tried that have worked, think about things that we've tried that maybe haven't worked. And, and, I, and I'm seeing some, some furrowed brows, but remember that this strategic plan was recently adopted, right? This is all new, well, th this is new work, and I understand some of these things are things that we've been involved in before, but I'm just being honest with you. This graphic that you're looking at here, the only thing we've done on this graphic are the school improvement plans, right? So there's only a fraction of the implementation work around the new strategic plan that's been done. This is a baseline report, not just on the data, but also on the work that's currently underway, right? So this is kind of a status report. It's not signaling everything that we that we intend to do. Um, we will still continue to work to develop out better, I think, strategies and refine those strategies as we do the other two thirds of, of this piece. And I think to your point, the reason I say this now, Mr. Frisch, is to your point, I don't know that we felt confident that we could achieve <laughs> larger goals until we had done, or larger targets until we had really done all of our best thinking about the strategies um, that we really want to support most consistently. I guess part of me wonders, it is always a goal, you always want to hit your goals. But if, we're, if we have the potential, of, particularly with the algebra goal, of breezing past 5%, how am I going to feel about breezing past 5% or almost getting to 9, right, if, if our goal was 10, right? Like, I feel like I'd rather be stretching a little bit than breezing past something. And the reason I zeroed in earlier in my questions about the number of uh, comparing the number of students, percentage of students who were in algebra in eighth grade uh, from last year to this year, because there's a huge increase. <clears throat> if that's the number one indicator of whether or not they're going to succeed in algebra, they have to take it, <laughs> right? Um, how much of that 5% is going to get knocked out just because we've increased access, right? And so in my head, it's like we need a bigger goal than 5% in the first year, um, because at a certain point, I honestly think we're going to be saying, you know what, we are at the point where 5% would be a huge win for us down the road when we have fewer and fewer things to try with a more and, uh, a smaller and smaller group of students. Um, so I just want that food for thought. The other uh, topic that came up, and I just want to finish my sentence, um, there was a question as to whether assessments could be offered in um, uh, home language. And that sounds like a perfect topic to add to our legislative program, which we'll be considering soon. Thank you. Did you want to put that on your next steps, Mr. Frisch? Sounds like it's already done. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. It's, it's quite right. robust. Okay, Thank guys. So we're supposed to finish at 2.15. I think we can add maybe five minutes. But I, there's a couple of people who still want go-backs. And I think, Ms. Marin, are you ready? Uh, yeah. I okay. Guess. Yeah, I just want to touch on two things. One is I'm very glad to see the special head enhancement plan in there. But to my recollection, where we left that was that there were a lot of very specific recommendations. And I just want to know what, what the plan is, because it was referenced as using some of those. And if I recall, Dr. Reed was going to come back with a plan about that. So I don't know if that needs to be a standing product or if it's going to be roped into uh, the, the forthcoming work. But I just wanted to ask about that. And also, is it worth it to talk about a dis type of disability in addition to special ed service level? Because I could see, you know, if you have a, a bunch of students who are dyslexic, right, you're going to give them the same thing. So maybe reporting out in that way and seeing how some of those strategies work according to disability. Uh, the final thing I'll say is, you know, I'm, I'm pleased to pass this forward on Monday. I think this is the most in-depth report I've seen on my tenure on the board, and I think that it's looking forward. So um, I think, too, I'm just reflecting on my own children's growth, and one of them with a, a major disability. It took years of very intensive services in an optimal environment uh, with good attendance. So, you know... I can only imagine how, and I think about the, sci the science of reading implementation, how we are turning that work around, and that's going to take years. So I'm, yes, I want us to go high and have these high achieving goals, but we also want to put a goal in sight. You know, a good goal is one that is achievable. And if you think 5% is achievable, and that's going to keep our staff motivated and our children motivated and it's developmentally appropriate, I think that's the right way to start. 
So I'm excited to see this baseline get used and hear more about which strategies you're finding are working. Thank you. No comments? Okay. All right, I will um, close up the second round. I, I will say my overall worry is I think, and th this has been my experience with my three young, young men, um, is that we do uh, test our kids when they come in, and it's, it looks like a little bit like a form of tracking, right? And so now we're trying to break that tracking. And when I look at this report, I don't, one of, the th one of the concerns that I had was that there wasn't real context as to what we had done before. We've had goals before. What did we achieve? What were we successful in? And I understand that this is 100 and plus pages, but it, I don't feel like I can understand what I'm doing unless I have proper context. So that's my, my first concern. Um, I talked a little bit about the baked in because I do see those tracks. And I also think it contributes to how kids see themselves. I see uh, it creating stress for them and competition for them and them feeling as though they're not measuring up because their kids, their friends are labeled in a different way. And so they're fighting to get that label, right? Especially at the high school level. I think they're more aware. Uh, I don't recall hearing anything on the playground. But um, that's, uh, that's a concern. Um, and then I think the last thing I want to say <clears throat> has to do with we can't do what Dr. Reed wrote over there unless we are offering something different, right? When we have those tracks, then they, this is your menu. You get beans, right, <laughs> or whatever. Beans of the equivalent in education. Okay, I, I won't explore that any further. But at any rate, um, we, everybody wants steak, right? <laughs> Um, and if you're not getting, we, at this point, the, the fidelity has not been achieved. Mm -hmm. At some point, it, you know, you have some schools offering those advanced math uh, opportunities very early and really building the thinking processes very early so that kids can be more than available by not just eighth grade. Some of them are doing it in sixth grade. But then you, you go to the other extreme, and you have schools that aren't offering it at all, as yeah. if they don't even have that expectation. And then you've got a myriad of things all the way in between. And so I'm looking for, I'm looking for how we are saying this is going to stop, because I think it's so grossly unfair to so many of us. And it's part of the reason families feel as though, depending on where you live, you get certain levels of, of education. Okay. Uh, we had a couple of people who wanted to go back. I think we have like 10 minutes. Can we do one minute per person, perhaps? Mm -hmm. Dr. Anderson. Yes, I'll be quick. I, I think we ask a lot of questions here. For me, personally, to be comfortable to vote on this as a plan, I actually would like to see a plan. Mm -hmm. Because there's a lot of conversation here in terms of avid expansion, in terms of the new strategies. but. I would like to see, one, what is the expected outcome of those strategies? I know what we want it to be up here, but we need to have the data to speak to it. Like the strategies that we have right now that we're continuing, what has been their impact? Because that will tell us whether we need to continue those strategies. So we need to do some further evaluation. But I would love to see a plan that outlines how this work will be actualized. That's missing for me in terms of how are we going to get there? Um, and I think lastly, in my nine seconds, I think I'm just going to let that go because I won't open this in nine seconds. But thank you. That's kind of my primary thing. I, I think I'm missing a lot of information. That was the point I was making just a, a few minutes ago is that we've not developed cons you know, those division plans for each of these metrics yet, right? This is a baseline report. Those plans are still to be developed. Aren't you worried that we can't actualize this in this year since the department plans are not even done yet? Well, there's a lot of things that we are doing. I'm not, I'm not trying to say we're not doing anything. What I'm trying to say is we haven't had the opportunity to develop all of our best thinking with all of the stakeholders, right? We haven't had developed those goal teams. Um, you know, we haven't finished the department improvement plans, right? We haven't really, as a, we haven't really applied system-wide, you know, leadership to all of this work yet. That's still in development. 
Um, so that, that was really the point that I was making. These things are still in development. Those plans are still to come. Um, but there are a lot of things that we're doing um, to achieve these targets regardless. So, you know, this is the first year of the plan. I, I feel pretty confident with the 5% targets in most of these instances that we're going to be able to hit those, right? Um, just with the work that we're doing around uh, partnering with schools and in the school improvement plans. But to hit the 90% target and close those gaps, as Dr. Reed drew on the board, there's going to have to be a lot more intentionality um, in, in developing those longer-term plans. Thank you. We've had some people leave. If, if I know you asked for, is there anybody else that wanted, wants, okay, these two, okay. And I think you were number three, so, okay. Ms. Corbett, I'm just going in the same order. Ms. Corbett Sanders. So you've proven our point, Dr. Presidio, that this is baseline data, a snapshot in time for 2023. Doesn't reflect the division strategies that have been ongoing for the past X amount of years. These are targets. They're not a strategy and they're not a plan. And so perhaps what you want to do is retitle this to be goal three highlights baseline data and targets. Because a strategy connotes an actual plan with uh, analysis data and timeframes for getting there. We don't have that. Okay. I'd meet you most of the way. What I would say and what I've been trying to say is that we have some strategies reflected in this work. We don't have all the strategies that we need. We don't have all the analysis behind all those strategies, as you were just saying, right? So there's still a lot missing. But my concern is that the public will read this and say this is the whole nine yards, and it's not the whole nine yards. So you don't want to end up having people say it's exactly what happened when the last strategic plan was adopted without metrics. We pushed to have metrics added after the fact. We pushed for the connection of the metrics to financial finance as being your budget. We don't have budget here either, which has to be a key division strategy. Correct. So my concern is that you're sending a message and when they pick it up and they go, oh, I'm going to be able to see it all there, it's not there. So I'm just trying to help you get to, this isn't, you know, maybe even um, uh, interim strategies or something, but you're not, your title doesn't mesh what's in the document. So, yeah, we certainly can take a look at that again. Thanks, I mean, I think we're they didn't have your time right. we're close to where you're saying with this slide. Not all the way there, right? It's a baseline report. It's highlights. It's baseline data, and we need to revise it a little bit it's more to reflect interim strategies, maybe or something. Right, yeah. because you got to disconnect, and I don't want you to yeah. ca be caught. No, I think that's, um, that's a good suggestion. Thank you. I, I'm really sorry that Dr. Reed isn't here, and maybe you can ask her to listen to this last part. I think these. Uh, comments are pretty critical. Um, yes, it, Mr. It, Smith. If I may, and I think that we may be able to do some things. One of the reasons why we have the team uh, created to actually be focused on the implementation of the strategic plan is that the goal report is just that, the, the baseline goal report to, to let the community, let staff, let everyone know where we are within this process. The things that Marcy and Dustin's teams will be developing with regard to implementation will outline what those implementation efforts are, and there may be an opportunity for us to then bring those back to the board, and I know that we're slated to bring those back to the board uh, on a regular basis, and it's that implementation piece that I'm hearing that perhaps is not here in this plan because the purpose was to, to highlight where we are so that we know where we're going to go and then possibly that implementation plan could be something that's separate and highlights the direction that we're going and then how we're going to get there. And I'm just throwing that out there as a consideration. I, 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 okay, I'll let my co colleagues continue their comments. Do, did I get to you yet? Okay, you're next. Um, a couple quick things. First, I wanted to sort of talk a little bit about um, your AVID. You talk about AVID and expanding AVID. And I know at some point the conversations came about embedding AVID strategies into advisory as well, so it would be available to everybody. Is that still something that you're working on? Can you stop my time, please? So, <laughs> yeah. Yes, it is, because we've made the information available um, to our advisory teachers. But again, you know, I have two kids in, in school, and their experiences in advisory are different from each other, right? So we still know that we've got a long way to go with 
helping teachers really understand those strategies and how to actually use them and, and work with students on them. So we've made the information available. It's, it's transferring in some instances, but we're definitely not where we need to be. I guess I would just lift that up because I think it's difficult to have both a strategy about increasing access to AVID and a strategy about increasing access to CTE because both of those are electives. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's strategies that may not work well when you're asking kids to give up a bunch of electives and also maybe want to take a language. So I, I think we really need, if we're going to embed some of those executive functioning learn to learn skills, we really need to use advisory. If you look at special ed kids and increasing access to CT for special ed, you're looking for AVID strategies, there's no elective left, right? So I think we really need to look at our different electives we're offering. The last thing I wanted to mention as well is, are we looking in some of the other ones at course taking patterns? Because when you look at middle school and you look at this sort of academic plan and, and CTE, whatever the word is in here, but I don't see the course taking patterns in here, so. Yeah, thank you, Ms. Sizemore-Heiser. The course taking patterns and the equity in, in course taking patterns comes with goal four report. Okay, thank you. All right, Mr. Frisch, I'm assuming you don't need to go back. Okay, Ms. Omesh? Okay, um, obviously leading up to this vote, there are a couple of things that I feel pretty strongly should be in there. Number one is specifying what will change or evolve the metrics, the goalposts, whatever, in the seven years, which we've all spoken to at some point. So that's one. The other is um, kind of the solutions to this opportunity gap. Like, we've been in this situation over 10 years before even this board came together. And it's only expanded since COVID. So I don't want this to kind of be like an OCR COVID situation where we all know the data, it's been the data, we're saying we're doing the same stuff. I'd rather not hear solutions that are like, let's continue doing, or we've been doing, or we are, con you know, there's clearly something that's still a problem despite all of that. So what is it that's transformative? To me, again, those individualized learning plans, at the very least, it could be an offer, a suggestion, and, and there could be some costing to it. That's fine. Let us consider that and discuss that as a board. And if it requires money, we can discuss that. Um, resources are always gonna be a concern. So that's the second component of what I think the strategy piece needs to be more than an afterthought, like not, oh, these are possible solutions and they're PD plus the things we're already doing. Um, and I say, I say that directly, but not hopefully disrespectfully. I just, I don't know that I can support a plan without that. And the final thing is, when it comes to that language piece, we're talking about SOLs and whatever, it's been years since SOL the SOL started of this being a problem. We're here, the state's not changing it. It doesn't look like they're gonna change it anytime soon, despite us advocating every year. So can we come up with an alternative way of measuring the progress of these kids in the meantime, at least, in, at least internally, so that we have an understanding of like what they're doing rather than telling them they're failures, like test after test after test? I think we need to find solutions for that. And anything less than innovation on that front seems a little complacent to me. But anyway, I do appreciate that there's been a lot of work on this. I hope that there's some responsiveness to those three components because uh, I'm finding it really difficult to move forward with this right now. Thanks, Ms. Omesh. Did you want another opportunity? Sure. I'll just say um, I continue to support. Oh, sorry. OK. Oh, well, I just want to say I support this goal three report. It's very clearly a report. I think we should use the appropriate vernacular. And I think it's, you know, we are telling the story of it today as we go. And it is a report with lots of creativity ahead of us. Thank you. Thank you. I'm so sorry, Ms. McLaughlin. You get your one minute. <laughs> no worries. Um, I wanted to add the use of our instructional coaches, if that is going to truly be a strategy, because we know that the professional development, um, there's just not enough time. And um, when we talk about budget and resources, we cannot afford to be pulling people out and paying for substitutes and all of that and disrupted learning for kids. I routinely still hear from our educators that they're not finding the PD to be meaningful. And yet, I think this has been a great work session to hear about all of the robust type of PD that you all want them to um, learn. I will also say that um, I'm increasingly frustrated that our amazing Virginia universities, name them GMU, GMU, and UVA, just for three big feeders for us to get teachers. I mean, I hope to goodness that 
what we're learning in 21st century best practices, that they start teaching it while those, those young teachers are in school. We cannot be Fairfax County University, and it's, it's kind of, I feel like we're the ones having to play catch up for them. So that would be my other advocacy to really hammer that point. Thank you. Okay, thank you everyone for um, working with us and trying to try to get as much comments in as possible. Um, I think I've expressed what my, you know, my baked in strategy hopefully was understood. I'm happy to clarify later if I need to. Um, I'm sorry, Dr. Dr. Reed missed that last little part. I, th I do think it got to the crux of what some of the concern is. Um, and I'm not sure, my biggest concern is are we, um, confusing or perhaps not providing enough information to the community to understand exactly what we're saying. A status report is different than a plan. I am not sure that this is actually a plan and it doesn't give us the context. So um, I do have some of the concerns that my colleagues had and now Mr. Frisch, dang it, I should have stopped talking. I wouldn't have encouraged him. Yes, Mr. Frisch. It's gonna take 10, 30 seconds. Um, I align with Ms. Marin on this front. I didn't come in here thinking this was going to be a plan. I came in here thinking this was gonna be a report, a baseline setting on where things stand. So I do look forward to getting a plan, but that's not what this was designed to be. Thank you. Okay, so um, I do wanna remind everyone to uh, fill out your next steps. I think that's going to be critical for uh, staff to understand what the concerns are. Um, and uh, I think we're going to stop. Can we take a five minute break and um, we'll turn it over to the next part of this meeting? and get started. Um, we have with us right now our budget fiscal forecast. And just for everybody who's listening as they get their last snacks and water, uh, Ms. Burden, as she's been doing for the last few years, will be offering us the fiscal forecast, just kind of the climate as we know it currently. But I think it bears, um, it's important to share that it is not at this point um, the most encouraging climate because we know, uh, Ms. Corbett Sanders, did you wanna talk about that? I know you've had some conversations and I also have had some conversations with um, Chairman McKay who has shared, I'm gonna scoot over so you can come over. Who has shared that they are expecting for some belt tightening on our part. Mm -hmm. And so we must keep that under um, advisement as we proceed through this presentation. After Ms. Burden goes through the presentation, we are going to have an additional discussion regarding our themes. Um, and I will speak about that in just a little bit because so far only two things had majority consensus. So we'll be doing a small activity to determine whether or not we want to consider other issues um, to raise into our theme, which will then be part of the board's resolution to be voted upon later on this year. So without any further ado, Ms. Burden. Good afternoon. Um, as Dr. Anderson said, today we're reviewing the preliminary fiscal forecast in preparation for the school board joint meeting uh, scheduled with the County Board of Supervisors on November 28th. Um, and Dr. Anderson, of course, will lead the discussion on the school board pr pr priorities after the, the fiscal forecast is completed. Now, I think it's important to say that this review is very high level and the forecast is not intended to usurp the superintendent's proposed budget because as you all know, we don't have a lot of information right now. Our enrollment projections are not yet finalized. State revenue doesn't come out until the third week of December. We don't have local composite index updates yet. Historically, they've come out in November. We still don't have those. We don't have updates on rebenchmarking. So this is a very high level because it's early days, as the young people say. Um, it's worth repeating that Virginia code mandates if you could, who's advancing slides? Okay. 
I don't normally do that. <laughs> so rational. Yeah, so it's worth repeating that the Virginia Code mandates that it is the duty of the superintendent to prepare a budget with the estimate of the amount of money deemed to be needed to support the school system. And that's commonly referred to as a needs-based budget. Y'all have all heard that um, on your years with the board. Um, these numbers, again, reflect preliminary broad estimates and are to illustrate potential expenditures only. And the total of the potential expenditures should not be interpreted as the recommended changes to the budget because we're not there yet. Based on our early projections, we're expecting an increase of $66 million in available revenue and an increase of $268.7 million in expenditures, which results in a projected gap of $202.6 million, or that would be the ask of the county um, for increased funding from local sources. The beginning balance funding of $28.1 million will be set aside. That is the same level that it is um, in the current year. It's usually around $25 million each year, and we usually fund that with year end. In fact, the, the 25 has already been set aside for 23 because we do that two years in advance. The state revenue assumption um, is due to our expectation that the recalculation of the local composite index will benefit us that the rebenchmarking as well as additional funding allocated for the support cap and the compensation incentives that were just added um, recently for this current fiscal year. And then Fairfax City, our tuition um, contract with them, they, we, when we assume a projected increase in our budget, that of course flows down to them, so we're expecting um, a little bit additional money from Fairfax City as well. Regarding the expenditure projections, the compensation increase at this early stage, um, we're projecting a 6% compensation increase uh, for all employees, and that is just an estimate. As far as benefits go, the information that we have right now is that our health care costs are going to increase. Our VRS rates will go down, or expected to go down at this point in time. Um, FCERS are also expected to go up, the county's retirement system, and the ERFC rates are flat because they are always uh, flatlined for every two years and they recalculate. And then base savings, of course, is their normal recurring savings due to turnover. Expenditure projections. Our required adjustments include enrollment growth and student needs. Again, this is an estimate. Enrollment uh, projections are not yet finalized. But what we're seeing right now is what we've seen the last couple of years, and that's that the overall projection is relatively flat, but it is the percentage of students that need uh, ESL support, special education support, and those that are eligible for free and reduced price meals. Those are the numbers of those special populations that we're seeing rise. So for now, we've got 17.1 million, but that is just an estimate. Contractual increases, that also is a routine adjustment that we do um, for inflation, utilities, fuel, major IT projects, those kinds of things. The 2% compensation adjustment effective January 1. Um, that is a required adjustment. It's not included with compensation because we've already given that increase in this year, and so we have to build that into the base for fiscal 25. The baseline recurring adjustments, um, you'll recall that the items listed here, fine arts stipend, stipends, uh, certified athletic trainers, achievement gap strategies, Schedule C, uh, retention and recruitment adjustment, all of those are recurring items that were funded at year-end fiscal 23, and so they too have to be added into the base in fiscal 25. And then transfers to other funds is about 2.1 million. Um, about 100,000 of that is the lease for the, the gatehouse, the debt service for that. And then the rest of it is the other two million is for turf replacement. Multi-year investments. The HR technology infrastructure project is in year three. Um, you all know that that project, I mean that um, infrastructure was implemented over 20 years ago and relies on many ad hoc databases uh, for support and reporting. This will support an updated and fully automated work system to support core operations for the entire division. And the board is scheduled to receive this contract award uh, on December 14th. The JET program, um, the Joint Environmental Initiatives, is also in year three, and we're slated to have funding of 1.8 million. 
Um, and that covers things like the local share when we apply for grants for um, electric buses, um, uh, three positions to support carbon neutrality, and some, a, a small amount of funds for the Get to Green program. Certified athletic trainers is in year two. Um, recall that um, in the current year, we included five additional athletic trainers um, for high schools, and then we'll do an additional five next year, uh, and in five years, we'll have all 25 of them done. And then a small amount of funding, $2 million, to accommodate uh, additional inclusive preschool classrooms. So again, based on our early, early projections, we're expecting an increase of $66 million, um, almost all state revenue, a little bit of other revenue, and uh, expenditure line item of 268.7, so that the projected gap, or what we would ask for uh, from local sources, is 202.6 million. We also thought that it would be that you all would be interested to hear that you know the, some key components from the JLARC study that Virginia school divisions receive less funding per student than the 50 state average and the regional average, which equates to approximately $1,900 per student in state underfunding of Virginia students. And many of Virginia's neighboring states spend more per pupil on average, including West Virginia, Kentucky, and Maryland. Also, you know that from the JLARC study that the current SOQs dramatically underestimate the actual costs of public education. Um, the SOQ formulas provide $6.6 .6 billion less than what was actually spent by local school divisions in fiscal 21. Um, it still uses Great Recession era cost reduction measures, and it does not adequately account for local labor costs. Um, so the, the JLARC study, study has highlighted what you know, we've pretty much been saying for years, and that is that the state is not doing its share. As far as the federal government goes, there are a couple of big unfunded mandates um, with them. Um, the federal government has not followed through on its promise uh, for IDEA funding. IDEA represents about 10% of FCPS costs, and the commitment was for 40%, and for FCPS that would be an additional $112 million. Nor are they fully funding impact aid. If impact aid was fully funded, we would see an additional 20.7 million, and we currently receive 3.7 million in impact aid. We also have um, a number of items that are not included in the budget. We just don't have enough information to include that now. They may very well end up in the superintendent's proposed. They may not. Again, the fiscal forecast is not intended to usurp the superintendent's proposed budget. Um, but if we, if we accept the CEP percentage lowering from 40% to 25%, that would be a $12 million add to our budget, $5 million on the food services side, and $7 million impact on classroom teachers. Um, implementation of the secondary security audit recommendations, we have a pilot going now, but it is not funded in the out years. Uh, market comparative placeholders, um, that's something that comes up every year, um, and so we've included that on the list. ESSER funded initiatives, like the special education teachers, 30 minutes, that has a cost of 24 million, that also is not included. Expansion of middle school athletics, you probably recall that in this year, we added cross country and track, um, and we, we, don't, we don't know yet what, we're, what we might want to expand that with. And then expansion of lighthouse schools, that is also uh, in pilot right now, and so under development. The special education enhancement plan, we do have $2 million in recurring costs for, for that AIR report um, information, and then we have $2 million of one-time dollars to be able to support the recommendations of the consultant. And then the fine arts stipend review, we did some selected fine arts stipend increases in, fiscal, in the current year, fiscal 24, but we need to take a look at all those, and that work has just not been completed yet. We also thought that it would be, you all would be interested to know what the Social Security cost of living adjustment is and how that compares to Fairfax. And including STEP plus MSA, the average Social Security COLA increase since fiscal 20 is 4.14% compared to the average increase at FCPS of 37 The next chart shows where we stand as far as the master's lane goes, step one. And this is why we are suggesting a 6% salary increase. 
Um, we also included the 2% that is um, going into effect on January 1. All of the divisions listed here gave 2%, except Manassas City Schools gave 3%, and Falls Church City Schools did not do the 2%. But be that as it may, we rank seventh of eight divisions in beginning pay for a master's degree. And we want to be number one. Uh, we want to tell every applicant that we see at a university job fair that Fairfax pays the most. That is very important. Um, it will take some time to get there. We can't do it in one year, um, but we want to be set up to, to meet that goal. And certainly collective bargaining will come into play, but how, we don't know yet. And, you know, it's also worth mentioning that K-12 education has evolved so much. Uh, I mean, in the last five years, in the last 10 years, you know, student needs have increased exponentially, uh, inclusive classrooms, um, pre-K, and the importance of pre-K. Full-day kindergarten is now expected. A decade ago, a lot of Virginia divisions still didn't have full-day kindergarten. Uh, learning management systems, one-on-one -on -one student devices, all of those things, mental health concerns, school safety and security, all of those are things that have uh, topped the priority list in the last four or five years, and I'm not sure that that's something, some of these are things that we would have envisioned even five years ago that that was something that we were going to need. So that's where we are right now as far as the fiscal forecast, um, and this again will be you know, provided we do a joint PowerPoint with the county um, for the joint meeting with the Board of Supervisors on November the 28th. As far as the school board budget guidance or um, budget themes, I will um, just go over a few things. You know, the objective is to identify broad themes that you would like to see the 25 budget centered around, um, discuss your guidance to the superintendent, and then the budget development process is a collaborative process, of course, involving many stakeholders. We prepare a needs-based budget based on the Virginia Code, and we, of course, always seek guidance from school board members on priorities, and we're setting up um, two-by-twos with the new school board members in January to just kind of give them a little heads-up flavor um, as far as the budget process goes and all of those things that they may not be familiar with. We still have our budget question process. We have a Google form. Either you can submit questions or your aide can submit questions. Um, you must be signed into your fcpsschools.net uh, account to access the um, budget question <coughs> Google form. And then here is our budget calendar, which the first thing on it, of course, is the November 28th joint meeting. And now I believe, well, Dr. Anderson, of course, did a Google Doc and asked you all for themes that you thought were important. And the, there were only two that had majority support, and that was compensation and equity. Um, there were a couple of other topics that had a couple, you know, one or two people that indicated they were interested in that. But most of them were other, which means only one person mentioned them. And Dr. Anderson is going to walk you all through what you're going to do to come up with a list of themes that you think we should consider. All right, thank you so much, Ms. Burden. I really definitely want to um, restate that we are going to have some additional conversations with the new board that will be in place. Most of us knew what that was like when we came in January of 2020, so it will be a very similar process. I'm glad that I participated in that and we'll be able to participate in bringing in the new school board members. So we'll have two parts to this um, conversation, and I know that some folks have a hard stop at four. Um, we are going to ask uh, Ms. Burden and her team any questions that we have regarding what was presented. Hopefully at the end of that part of the conversation, I want to bring back the other um, ideas and suggestions that came up um, during my conversations with you, during your completion of the Google document, regarding other things that we'd like to prioritize. Um, they're not listed because, again, they were maybe one or two people who mentioned them, but I'm hoping we can set up some conversations here to raise some of those um, priorities as themes, which is guidance to the superintendent. And again, anything that is collected and 
included in our themes will be part of the resolution to be voted upon later this year. Um, so with that, I will invite you all to ask um, Ms. Burden and her team any questions that you have. And after we finish that round, I hope maybe it's just one, then we can engage in the themes um, discussion. Can I just yes, please. Thank you, uh, Dr. Anderson. I just want to level set a little bit. This uh, year is different than in 2020 when people came in in January. Um, we know that uh, there is going to be some challenges at the local level, but we also know there's a lot of pressure at the state level to uh, change and increase funding. So there are a lot of unknowns, but I want people to take into account that uh, there is a high likelihood that there will be Title I cuts at the federal level. The question is how much? We have a current speaker in the House of Delegates who is, or a, a House of Representatives who has suggested as much as 80% of Title I funding cuts. That would be uh, pretty significant for this county. Luckily, we do not depend too much on the federal government because we've had chronic underfunding. When we add up the chronic underfunding from the 1,900 per pupil um, in Fairfax County versus our neighboring states, the IDEA funding and the impact aid, it actually comes up to $477,800,000. So the Taxpayers, our local taxpayers, are picking up the delta. And that's when, uh, when you have conversations over the next few days and with your community members, that's the number that we should be talking about, is that there are commitments made by the appropriators at the federal and state level that have not been realized. $477 million. We are forced to continuously go back and ask for additional funding, but we also know that at the local level that uh, the other agencies within Fairfax County government have been asked to take a significant pay cut or um, reduction in budgets. So uh, I just wanted to level set that a bit as we begin this conversation. And thank you so much because our budget team does work very diligently to try to find additional funds elsewhere and to um, provide appropriate benchmarking to local um, agencies. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Corbett Sanders. We are going to start with our school board members with their questions and comments, and we will have three minutes. Uh, Mr. Okay, he took that down. Okay. <laughs> Ms. McLaughlin. Um, yes, can we pull up the slide that shows um, the master's salaries um, around the jurisdictions? There we go. Um, Dr. Reed, this is an important one for the board, for you, the public, and the incoming board. I, I say this over and over and over again. Um, we will continue to lose on the recruitment and the retention messaging to our employees if this is how your staff keeps putting the information out because it's not accurate. The bottom line is out of every jurisdiction up there, we are the only ones with ERFC. And Ms. Burden, can you repeat again, what is the employer contribution for the ERFC? 6.5%. Okay, so Dr. Reed, if we added 6.5% to go back into those pay scales and to that salary, then we would not be sitting where we are. And I keep bringing this up, Ms. Burden, because I know you understand this as CFO, that we get a finite amount of money from the Board of Supervisors. You mentioned that in your remarks just now, that we have all these competing needs. But if this board, and Dr. Reed is superintendent, and your leadership team do not understand that if we keep putting up those slides, the lack of financial honesty about why that's there, to anyone who's listening, 6.5% is 6.5%. So we're offering a program that no other jurisdiction has, and it costs us an employer contribution of 6.5%. So. There is no reason that we don't have this honest conversation with everybody. If people want us 
to be at the top of the salary scale, what are we doing about the extra 6.5% that we give our employees and the other jurisdictions do not going into a secondary pension system? Doctor, That's kind of a question because I still have 48 <laughs> seconds. So our, I think that the F ERFC obviously is a tangible benefit. Um, and so I think what you're expecting is to see that reflected on this chart. Is that correct? Okay. We can capture that as part of a compensation package, separate from salary, but part of a compensation package. What would that look like, Ms. Burden, if we were to, the 6404, would that just be another column for, I mean, I don't know what other divisions, I know they don't provide ERFC per se, but I, are there other compensation enhancements we would also want to reflect for other divisions, or are we unique in ERFC? alone in other words i don't know if others have travel or if others have things that might also be um, accounted for just curious about that generally erfc is um, the big item because none of the other divisions offer um, a supplemental retirement program or an additional local retirement program i mean you have some you know i think arlington does a twenty dollar match per month for 403b um, but mostly, we're the only ones. Um, and just to be clear, um, this chart reflects salaries, and ERFC is not salaries. That is a benefit. Okay. But, I mean, it is a unique benefit for Fairfax County. So, and 6% would put us back up in a, yeah, right. It would put us, okay. I understand your point, Ms. McLaughlin, and I will, um, we will address that. So, yeah, I was doing the math. Thank you, Mr. Frisch. I, I had about 65.5, but it's somewhere in that range. So to everybody's point, if you add another 6.5% that the employer is giving every month into the ERFC and not into their paycheck, the annual salary would then be 65500 The top one from Arlington is 64000 so we are the only school division in Northern Virginia that does the ERFC, the only one. It costs us money to do that program. And so I am not disagreeing with, so don't have ERFC anymore. Keep it solvent for those who paid into it, but stop doing it for new employees. I am not saying that. That is a big decision to make. But I am incredibly worried as I leave this board that if you don't at least have another slide so every employee understands that there's another six and a half percent you get when you come to work for FCPS you won't come or you may not stay it's that simple yes ma'am thank you Ms. McLaughlin Mr. Frisch thank you picking up where Ms. McLaughlin left off um, I think you know more than just being in the in the the midst of everybody i think we want to be leading everybody um including with tangible money being brought home and so while i accept the point that we need to do a far clearer job of communicating what you're getting when you walk in the door here um i think it's also important that we are more competitive with the actual salary that's being offered um, which will not only give us the ability to talk about that um, supplemental retirement uh, benefit, but also that we are leading the pack. Um, and I think that's a goal we should be striving towards. Um, because to be clear, ERFC, in my opinion, is not even enough, you, you know, um, in terms of what we currently offer compared to what we've offered in the past. Um, and retirement for most workers is in a perilous position compared to where it was uh, a generation or two ago. And so anything we can do to increase not only somebody's stability entering the system by having a higher income, but also their stability leaving the system should be something that we're striving for. Um, we can't control what other school divisions do in that regard, but we can control what we're doing for our employees. Um, and I think our goal should be to grow both of those things and to widen the net of the people within our system that are included in that. 
um, however we can do that possible. Now, that being said, we are in this situation with our current budget forecasting. Um, and in my conversations with Dr. Anderson about my priorities, I've indicated that compensation is my, my top priority. Um, and I think that needs to be our priority. Um, I, you know, we can't, you know, whenever we have these conversations, I think it's also important that we stress that when we do get extra money for pay from the state, even though that's not what we're talking about here, uh, when we do get matched money from the state, we're paying more than 80% of the fee uh, to access that money where another county might pay 50% to get a 50% match. So, um, you know, our most recent raise was tens of millions of dollars on our part for, for millions in the single digits on their part um, when another division might pay 10 million to get 10 million. Um, so uh, I hope that as we move forward, we can continue to offer increased compensation um, because you know the last few years, we've been able to do that the last couple of years, but we need to do it even more. Um, this number is not the only number that, that shows our competitiveness, uh, but it is a starting one that kind of reverberates throughout the early career of an educator. Um, so I appreciate all the work that's gone into this uh, from Ms. Burden and her team and from our chair and vice chair on budget, um, because we're gonna have to have some very you know, frank conversations in the weeks and months ahead. Thank you, Mr. Frisch. Ms. Tolan. Thank you, I'll be, I'll be quick. Um, I, I am happy to follow Mr. Frisch. I think that, and, and follow the conversation that we had um, earlier in the day on goal three and how do we achieve what we need to achieve for goal three. And this is only one of the five goals in that strategic plan. I suspect that the additional um, baseline reports that we get will kind of say the same thing. Unless we get you know, the best and the brightest in front of our kids um, and figure out you know, how to recruit them and how to retain them, um, we're going to have a hard time achieving our strategic plan goals. So. Um, you know, I also had compensation as my number one, you know, thing for budget this year. So just wanted to express that. Thanks. Thank you, Ms. Omesh. Yeah, thank you for putting this together. Um, I guess I just had some questions first. Um, the piece that says baseline recurring adjustments and then transfers specifically like admin schedule C adjustment and then turf, can you just elaborate on what those are? The baseline recurring yeah that slide this one yeah yeah the baseline recurring adjustments are the items that were on year end in fiscal twenty three um, recall that we had to reduce our budget uh, in fiscal twenty three at adoption based on the funding levels provided by the state and the county and these are the items that we wanted to put back in the budget, um, but we weren't able to because of the funding levels. And so we funded these items with year-end money, which is one-time money. And so we have to get them in the base for the next year so that they're then funded with recurring dollars. So that's what all those items are on baseline recurring adjustments. And then the transfers to other funds, um, the county does a calculation on debt service and tells us what our increase is. This year, it's only $100,000, and that is for the gatehouse lease. It's the debt service on that. And then the other is a turf replacement to support the scheduled replacement of turf fields. Life expectancy of our turf fields is no more than 10 years, and so they have a replacement schedule, and this is our piece of that that we transfer. Okay, thank you. I mean, I guess, Dr. Reed, for some of these pieces, I always have questions about kind of the, the levels of urgency and how we assign them, understanding that, you know, we had wanted to do these things in the past and we just haven't afforded it. And now we're looking at a massive shortfall. Can we not, like, go back and look into it again and reconsider, right, like how we time them and what, because this is all just adding up to what you're putting as the cost, right? Yes. At this point in time, our field school forecast shows that we would need $202 million. Um, and that, that does sound like a lot for an increase in, in local transfer, but if you look back at last year, uh, at the fiscal forecast, we identified our needs as $177 million, and what was funded was 144. 
So it's a little higher than, than what we saw last year, but not, not crazy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Do you have a guess as to how much? Is that too early to ask? Oh, yeah, we have. It's, okay. it's early days. We, this yeah. is just our best guess right now at this moment. And, you know, it could change tomorrow. It and will the, change tomorrow. Were you going to say something, Marty? No? This is not the ask. We don't know what that is yet. The superintendent delivers the budget at the end of January, and that will be the ask. Okay, yeah. I mean, Dr. Reed, we say every year somebody around this table ends up saying, like, okay, where can we be more, more efficient? Where can we sunset stuff? Where can we save? Where can we? And, like, I really would love for us to have, like, while we present what the requirements are going to be, what we're needing, blah, 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 to also say, hey, here's the evaluation we did over the year. These are the things that we're no longer going to need. I don't know if we're going to actually end up with a different pre with another presentation before our term ends, but if we do, I would really like to see that, like a slide two or three of like, you know, we've done an internal cleanup and like here's what is wasting money. Um, I don't know, Leif, like anything off the top of your head sticks out to you as to how, where or how we've done that maybe. We remember we started a program review back in, oh gosh, was it right before COVID or right after? Oh, yeah, it was a while and, ago. And a while we, ago. <laughs> yeah, in the middle. We did, I mean, we did staffing. Yep. Um, we went over that with you. We went over ISD. Um, but it, I don't know if it wasn't believed to be helpful or, I, I don't know, but it was abandoned. Uh, it may have just been due to the environment that we were all working in at that point. But, but, but you're right, we, I think with the, that a review is, is probably in order, but the, um, I mean, to try to do that by this budget season would almost be impossible. I mean, it's just so big and to try to capture everything and present and have it analyzed and make recommendations is just a huge process that would take staff resources and of course your all's time as well. Or yeah, I mean, more. maybe if we start somewhere where it's like we don't have to have the full process in place, but hey, we've known over a few, you know, a few years that something's a little stinky in this area, maybe there's something, you know, like smaller piece, piecemealing it essentially this year. And then in future years, hopefully we'd have a more robust process. I don't know if that's doable. I, th I think it's worth mentioning that, you know, 90% of our budget is salaries and benefits, and 10% is everything else. Um, in addition to that, 93% of our positions are school-based positions. And school-based positions are largely governed by their staffing standards, which align with the standards of quality. Um, and so the, the majority of our budget at the schools starts at zero base every year, and we take the enrollment projections, which are still being finalized, and apply the staffing formulas to it, and that determines the level of staffing at each school. So it's not just an add-on every year, oh, they've got 20 teachers, we're going to give them 22 next year. We start from zero every single year. And that's, that's for the bulk of, of our budget. Um, yeah, no, that's fair. I mean, I think I, I do wonder, Dr. Reed, like, during COVID, we had kind of bulked up on the technology specialists and like, you know, we have these advanced academic resource teachers that were just kind of added on because it worked in some places. And maybe we can look at that because they're applying a formula that's like, hey, the school has this, it needs this because these numbers exist, which is, by the way, a very old formula, right, Lee? Like that's been around a while of just how we calculate staffing. No, I mean, they're reviewed every year, and, you know, occasionally, I mean, I think we've had two or three, four changes since I've been here, and I've been here five years. Um, so they are changed periodically, um, but it's, you know, and we just had a, a deep dive into the staffing um, by ERS that was presented to you all in February of 22. Um, yeah, I guess I'm thinking of the one that specifically targets, like, F, by the number of FRM, FRM EL, and Ms. special Obey, ed. If I could have you wrap up that sentence and put you on a go back, and then I know you asked a question for Dr. Reed to respond to regarding staffing. <clears throat> I do think we can take a look at a number of programs. I think, 
um, I think the conversation earlier about the resources connected to are we closing achievement gaps? If the resources that we have in place when we evaluate them in some objective manner are not showing the impact we hope, then I think it is time to make a, you know, a move. So I, um, I think anything's possible at this point. But I think where your frustration is is every year we get to a place where we talk about it and it's either too late or it's not time yet and we never seem to get to it. Yeah, right. so. and, and to put a bow on it, I came in and we're like, we serve a county of over 1.1 million constituents with a $3.2 million budget. And now we're like, oh, a 3.6 <laughs> million, you know? Oh, and it's okay, like, Ms. have Omej. we seen the achievement increases? I don't Please know. bring all of that yeah. into your next <laughs> right. um, round. Uh, Ms. Sizemore Heiser. Thank you, and actually we'll pick up where Mr. Mesh left off because I know when we started on the board, we had our uh, program budgets and the COVID made a lot of that difficult. Ms. Tolan and I actually had brought a forum topic and had a work session on program review to really start to dig into what programs are we offering and where do we have them. And I think, Dr. Reed, um, given that we have a new strategic plan, we're talking about sort of the implementation path forward, and we're talking about the workload on our teachers and staff, I think this is a really ripe time to really look at what are we offering? Are we getting the ROI for the programs we need? What um, that we expect our teachers to do, our programs we have, all of that are in alignment with our strategic plan goals and, and really take a deep dive into are we being the most efficient and effective with our resources on implementing our strategic plan and moving the needle forward? And so I know one thing we talked about in PEC a little bit is do we need to, as we're looking, starting to look at our standing committees, is do we maybe need a finance committee that during the year can get these reports on the program budget to work in tandem with the budget committee? So the budget committee is working on the budget this year, whereas the finance committee is doing a little more of the deep dive into the next year's budget to kind of do that in t work in tandem, right, reporting to the board. So otherwise it feels like every time we have a budget committee, there's so much work with, you know, with great respect to our budget committee, but so much work on this year's budget, we don't have the time and space to really do that deeper dive, whether it's a program budget reporting or whether it's looking at our programming in alignment with the strategic plan. So I think there's some space here to look at our own structure to see where do we have room to work with you and your staff on that deeper dive. So just something I'm gonna kind of put out there to, to think about as we move forward. But I do think, you know, especially given a tough budget year, we have to consider how we talk about everything we need. Right, so the second piece I wanted to lift up is I think from what I'm hearing, and I, I myself included, compensation is is high, is top on my list because without good teachers and paying them well, nothing else matters, right? They can't, we can't do the work of implementing the strategic plan without good staff. So, you know, we're looking at a $200 million ask in the advertised budget. What's the communications plan to go with that to start building out what and why are we asking for this? What does it mean? How does it impact us remaining the premier school system that we are? I think I don't want to get caught in conversations with you know our local board of supervisors, with our public, without really having some good thoughtful analysis on how do we explain what we're asking and why we need it. I mean, a couple things I can lift up at the top of my head is you know, our teacher shortage, right? And how in our compensation, to Ms. McLaughlin's point, ERFC and our salary and our benefits, but just the fact that we need to pay teachers more in a supply and demand. I wanna lift up the, the changing needs of our students. But I think we need that sooner rather than later. Agreed. Thank you. Um, I don't see any others, so we will go to Ms. Corbett Sanders. <laughs> Thank you, um, and I'm glad to follow Ms. Sizemore Heiser because um, some of you may know that I was the school board member who under the last board actually in, uh, pushed to have our uh, budget, link, our strategic plan linked to our budget. And I would suggest that um, in any conversation when it can't be, oh, 90% of our budget is school-based because that really doesn't say anything when we're a school-based system. What we need to do is talk about X percentage is tied to supporting our students with disabilities. X percentage is for uh, meeting the needs of our students who are in Title I schools. X percentage is, you know, so from that standpoint, we also need to be able to very clearly state 
how we are picking up the shortfall that is not available to us where the federal government should be funding it. So when we talk about supporting our students with disabilities, which we want to do um, and be the premier system doing so, we need to also say, and because of that commitment, we spend X amount of dollars on it. Um, I think that it's also important, uh, and as you all know, I really pushed for contracting transparency and oversight. The one thing that we might want to consider going forward is actually having as part of our budgeting process and as part of our transparency initiative, maybe in your finance committee, is to say, um, and these contracts, contract A directly contributes to this part of our strategic plan. Contract B contributes to this portion of our strategic plan. So that it all goes back to our strategic plan is student focused and about student achievement focused and ensuring that all students have access to opportunities. And along those lines, tell us what you value, show me your budget, and this is how our budget links to each of those priorities. And that makes it much more much easier in our conversation with our colleagues at the Board of Supervisors and with the state, and frankly, I hope that it will move the needle in conversations with the federal government as well. Thank you. Thank you. I am going to take my turn. I actually had a question for Dr. Reed that I will put into this room and hopefully will reiterate um, when she comes back. But before I get there, I wanted to go back to the master's scale um, page, and I appreciate what was said by both um, Ms. McLaughlin and Mr. Frisch, and I think we were at Falls Church High School and telling the students there what our pitch is for teachers. You know, come, the work is hard, you don't have enough time to do it, and we don't pay you enough, but it's great. Um, we kind of have to spin a different tale there. Um, but I also thought, Ms. Um, Burden, that we also talked about what the ranking is for our beginning teachers without a master's. Can you refresh our memory on that? Where do we fall? Yeah, we rank fourth of eight with the bachelor's. We're a little bit more competitive there um, compared to the other divisions. Thank you. Um, the other piece that I wanted to ask, and this is the question for Dr. Reed that I'll pose, pose into this room, um, reviewing the board's resolution from last year. Um, it was fairly long, there were a few bullets, and this is the last bullet. It says, over the next budget cycles, a means to review the return on investment of programs and their integrity of implementation shall be considered along with metrics and accountability for the alignment between the budget and the new strategic plan. And I wanted to raise this because this is the conversation that we have each and every year. We only have so many, we have finite resources. Are we putting them in the best places that we, that we get the most bang for our buck? And I think that's the consensus around the room. Wait, do we not have enough? Yes. Um, that we are not doing that. I don't think it has to be as big of a heavy lift as the program review, which happened under Ms. Marin's watch. And I'm sure she could speak in terms of to how heavy of a lift that was for staff. But if staff is starting again at zero every year, why can we not have a more transparent part of that conversation be part of this process? Like when we were looking at this, whether it's ISD or OSS, whatever the departments are, these are the things that we are wanting to shift away from in order to repurpose funds, particularly this year when we do have the strategic plan. There had to have been something that fell off of the, the table. I think we are looking to know and to have some insight into those conversations. So I will pause and let you respond if you have any answers, uh, Ms. Burden, but this is really directed at Dr. Reed, um, and she is not here for that. And I hope that I can take privilege to restate this when she joins us. Um, so I'm going to pause here so I can do that. Are there any other speakers? I know we have a go back for Ms. Omesh, so we will do that at this point. And then Ms. McLaughlin. Okay, go ahead. Should I go ahead? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So um, I guess in building off of where I left off, um, yeah, and I said million was a slip of the tongue. Billion, obviously, but going from 3.2 billion at the beginning of our terms in this board to now well beyond that, again, question mark of like, have we really moved the needle? 
I don't know, not, not, not that much. I know we dealt with COVID, which wasn't a small feat, but still, right, it's a question of like, where's, where did the money, like where's the money going and what have we evaluated and decided to sunset? So that still remains, which brings me to perhaps what the action item would be, and Dr. Anderson, this one is really more to you, actually, <laughs> in, in how we start off with the new board, um, which is why I've actually wanted to be on the budget team several times around here, but here we are. So, um, I mean, one, I've talked repeatedly about the needs assessment process. We cannot have this arbitrary thing of like, oh, superintendent thinks this is cool, and some board member brought up another idea <laughs> without any sense of equity or, or prioritization and urgency around what actually matters and what's gonna make an impact. So, what would that look like? Ideally, that would be a year-long process, and that would predate this budget fiscal forecast, right, and like the conversations we have when it comes to our level as a board. The, there are so many ways this is done across the country. The most obvious is even the congressional process, but you know, various departments and various agencies and offices can, can do their research and talk to their people on the ground and bring up that information, and then they prioritize and offer requests and recommendations to the superintendent, right? Superintendent looks at all these various plans and then like assesses accordingly where their urgency lies. Because we also cannot be relying on a bunch of group, uh, student activists or whoever, a group of activists that show up at a school board meeting and insist and all of a sudden I'm seeing it on the slides and we have no concept of how urgent that was relative to a million and one things that haven't been brought up. So um, that's one. And relatedly, the ROI stuff, is a similar component, right? It's, it's hand in hand. So each department would not only look at what they need, but what, where they, we can even challenge them to try to be budget neutral and how they bring that. Like, we need this more than this this year. Um, so both of those pieces, I really hope through your leadership on the budget, you can bring a new board that develops these practices and it becomes a habit moving forward. I've tried, but. No, I, <laughs> you know. I, I, I don't think you'll get any disagreement from anybody from around this table. And I, I think Ms. Sizemore Heiser did capture it well from the conversation at PEC, doing both in tandem. It's just almost impossible while you're building. We're building this ship right now. So that other work, I, I think it really lives probably right after we pass the first budget. I mean, right after we pass the budget, then you could begin that work where departments would have the whole year. I see space for this to be much more clearly delineated in our resolution this year. So I am writing that down um, for this board's consideration once we get the language going. But I think uh, the process building for that, Dr. Anderson, starts actually now, where we're doing that back end stuff to prepare it so that when that year, this that's year. That's a little bit more complicated than just the finance committee that I'm on. I think the committee that Ms. Sizemore Heiser mentioned that Peck is gonna bring forward may be helpful for that. Uh, Ms. McLaughlin, then Mr. Frisch. And I could possibly answer some. Thank you. Did you want to answer the question that I posed earlier? And I can answer both of those questions, I think, to, to some extent. Uh, so when we were talking about the, the ORSI portion of the presentation earlier with goal three, uh, Ms. Aruda and her team are very instrumental in the uh, helping us develop our metrics, uh, helping us as we analyze data. Her team has also been tasked as uh, we were directed as part of the resolution last year to ensure that we do have a return on investment uh, structure or framework that we can use as we're making decisions around the budget. Uh, because uh, for us to, uh, to have highlighted the work that we've highlighted for goal three that we've shared with you today, and to then go into that work without recognizing what are we doing today, where are we getting the, the biggest bang for our buck, what's working, what's not, we need to have that uh, the, uh, the ROI tool that we can use with fidelity across the system. Uh, we know that as uh, Dr. Presidio brought uh, his plan forward back in 2020, I remember I was in my office at home when we had that presentation, as we all were, uh, he shared his process, and I think that it's important for us to have a uniform process across all offices that we're uh, calculating that ROI in the same way. So there's one aspect that's tied to 
the ROI or where uh, we will have that tool ready as we go through that budget process. The second piece, though, uh, that we have engaged ORSI is uh, really around increased uh, program evaluation. Uh, we know that over time, uh, the Office of Research and Strategic Improvement, ORSI, uh, was previously known as the Office of Program Evaluation. And so that office will be bringing um, more program evaluation back into its portfolio so that we have this uh, tandem approach of evaluating programs uh, at a central level and then uh, teams also evaluating the, the impact. When, when we have our metrics, when we have our student outcomes, did we hit our student outcomes? And if we did, then we should continue this work. If we didn't hit our student outcomes, then how do we reallocate those funds or those positions in a different way? And that's all going to come forward as part of the budget process, and her team is working on that at this time. Thank you so much. Uh, Ms. McLaughlin, and then Mr. Frisch. Thank you. Uh, maybe picking up a little bit what Ms. Amish was talking about, and you know, every year it's about what our budget priorities are. Um, but as I've been talking repeatedly with Dr. Reed, and I say this to my colleagues, for the four of you who will remain, 90% of the money that goes out of the door of FCPS, 90%, just about, is going to compensation. So if we do not have, as a board, as a school division, a strategic mission critical focus on how the 90% of that 3.5 or $6 billion is being spent, then all the other things you do when you study this budget, that's, that's the other 10%. For my entire time on this board, through multiple CFOs and, and leaderships from the superintendents, I've said, you don't have to do zero-based budgeting. You just have to go with what's federally required and state mandated first. Start there. So you go from there and that's what are we required in terms of SOQs. Put it there, it's there, you gotta do it. But there's a whole lot we do that is outside of the state and, and federal mandates, our SOQs. And we know that because when the state very generously says we're gonna give a raise to our teachers, well, FCPS's interpretation is, well, that's a raise for all employees. Well, that's not how the state intended it. They intended it for, intended it for teachers who they believe are, are not being compensated in competitive salaries. So there's a whole lot more local money that has to go into every time we're trying to bring up salaries for what is recognized as teachers on the front lines. And that is not me discounting all the other professions that support our schools. But I want everybody to understand the distinction that the state makes versus what we hold locally. Um, I really hope that the next board with Dr. Reed's leadership is gonna be in a better position than I certainly feel like the 12 years I tried to get our budgets to be authentically more strategic. and. It matters. It affects the 90% of our people. Thank you, Ms. McLaughlin. Um, 100% of our people did the 90% of our budget. And that's actually something we will talk about as soon as we get into the second part of our work here today. Mr. Frisch. Yeah, on the, the subject of the program budget, I think in the past when we've looked at it, it's felt like a defense of the status quo, whether it's intended to or not. And I get that. Um, you know, you have conversations about what could or should be removed from our our focus and people get nervous, especially if there's no clarity around exactly what's going to happen. And when you have these conversations about what could maybe happen um, without any kind of um, concrete plan, I think you can make a lot of people very nervous about their future in the system. Um, it, it was good to see a lot of heads nodding about the idea of a finance committee. Um, you know, one of the things that excites me about that is not only the ability to focus um, on projects that maybe are a one-year shelf life, but there's also probably an opportunity there to focus on things that take longer than a year uh, to really dig into. And so, um, you know, I, I believe Peck did move that forward at the last, nope, we didn't. Go ahead. We discussed it. We voted to move it forward, but we haven't really 
put any parameters around it. It was just kind of came up at the last minute. Right. So we were going to finalize kind of the parameters at the next meeting and then bring it forward. So I think we'll all be eager to, to take a look at that uh, and have conversations about it um, uh, because I think it's a priority for everybody. Right, one last, it was going to be added to your survey about standing committees in general to send to the board. Okay, thank you, Mr. Frisch. Ms. Dernock Kofax has not yet spoken. Um, why don't you go ahead and take your time? Thank you. Um, I'm sorry I had to go in and out today. Um, but I, I do want to say, uh, following along with what some of my colleagues have said, um, you know, we realize that so much of our budget is salary based, and rightfully so. So, how then do we um, decide? Um, that we're not just defending status quo. These are some of the things that I've just heard said. I'm gonna ask you all as our staff, because I've been here 12 years. I've seen good, bad, ugly budgets. Um, and um, what, what would you do differently? You're gonna have a new board of eight members, eight new members in less than 30 days, or a little more than 30 days, I should say now. And, and so what would you all suggest that would be different, that could help about the fact that, you know, are we really getting fully funded when we're only funding salaries? What do we do? How can we do this better? And you might not have an answer now, but any thoughts on that? Well, that's something that I would generally like to discuss with the superintendent, not in a public session. Gotcha. I well, don't want to get out ahead of my superintendent. Well, let's have Dr. <laughs> Reed respond. She just came back. You may not have seen her. Okay. Did you hear my question, more or less? It, it, it's basically that, you know, the, the comments made from the board have been like, um, you know, 90% of our budget is salaries. We need to compensate. Comp compensate our, our teachers and our administrators to have the best in the region for all the reasons we discussed earlier today. But I said, I've been here a while, and so what you do is you kind of look around the margins for new initiatives, and what would your thoughts be if you were going to change that process? How could we do it better, and how will you look to make that more helpful to a new board that's coming in? Well. Thank you. Um, I think number one, compensation is critical for all of our employees. Our drivers, our IAs, our custodians, our liaisons, teachers, principals, central office. I mean, salary, is a, it's critical. Um, looking around at different initiatives, I would go back to our core mission right now and our strategic plan, which is closing yeah. gaps for kids. So, um, and part of the quality of that gap closing work is determined by the quality of the individuals we have working with our children. So that goes back to compensation. Um, so I would say that, um, I don't know that I would look at a different process, but um, we can't do everything we've always done budget wise and program wise and expect different results. That's clear. Yes. Um, I also know that any freeing up of substantial amounts of money to actually put toward a salary increase is not trimming around the edges in different places. It's actually a pretty significant, it's increasing class size or it's eliminating an entire strata of employee class or do you know what I'm saying? Like it's not an insignificant move to free up tens of millions for salary. So I think... It's a, it's a value as much as it's going to be a process, to be honest. But I think if we stay true to the core, which is doing what's best for our students and making sure that we um, not just adequately but effectively uh, provide compensation for all of our staff here in Fairfax County, we're going to achieve that. Um, so I guess I'll leave it there for the moment. No, I, I, and I do appreciate that. I, I know I kind of put you on the, both on the spot, and I didn't mean to do that. But what I have seen, like you said, the only way when we were truly not fully funded, when we needed those monies, the only thing that we did twice in a row was increase class sizes. And that's the only way you can get big chunks of money. Um, so that's not ideal, and it took us years to work back from that, and we still are not um, 
you know, we're still not an, in an ideal size for some of the, the needs that our students have, just like we talked today. So um, last question. Can to you please you, start her time? Uh, yeah, that, that's okay. I only have one more big question question and they're kind of related and and they both have to do with the federal government so I'm wondering why we put zero I'm sorry I missed that why do we have zero um, for the federal government but you know this is a big number that we continue to see and the, the needle has not moved in 12 years about IDEA we are all in support of making sure each one of our special education students has exactly what we need and I think we have put our money where our mouth is there but still, the federal government is falling short over $112 million. Um, that, that's huge. And I guess I'm not understanding um, what will the impact be to us with the impact of the federal government um, lowering the CEP percentages from 40 to 25. So first one, uh, you know, well, make this the first one because that's the easier one I think you could answer for me. Yeah, the 40 to the 25. 40 to 25. Um, if you reduce it to 25% that are directly certified by the state as eligible for free and reduced lunch, um, basically there's a multiplier that you multiply that by and that determines their free and reduced rate. Um, so in general, at least based on historically, then that becomes about 80%. So even though 100% of the students at that school are eating free, the federal government is only going to reimburse us for 80%, which means the other 20% is on us. Yes. So $5 million will be the cost in food services to drop that um, CEP percentage from 40% to 25%. In addition to that, um, that typically raises the free and reduced rates at the schools that would be newly designated as CEP. And because our staffing standards are for classroom teachers are based on um, there's it's weighted for free and reduced kids so that so the more that you have the greater classroom teachers you get and so if we did that then that would have a seven million dollar increase for in, in classroom teacher staffing at those schools um, so the total is about 12 million 12 folks million. I'm gonna have to do a quick time check so if we could keep the questions and answers really succinct because we really do have to get to the second part of the board's um, priorities, and I want to at least make sure we have uh, 40 minutes for that. Uh, Ms. Sizemore-Heiser? Yeah, just, just really quickly, and I think um, to pick up on Ms. Dana Koufax's point a little bit, you know, we've, as we're getting into potentially more tighter budget timeframes, um, Dr. Reed, I, I really do think as we're looking at our budget process, by the time we even get to this point where we're talking about the fiscal forecast, because while it is not the budget you're presenting in January, right, it's not as fleshed out, it does have some things listed on there as priorities. I think we, we really need to back that up with the why, the alignment, and what happens if we don't get it, which I think what Ms. Dana Kofax is talking about with having to increase class sizes or other things. You don't have to have it all flushed out, but I think Otherwise, we allow narratives to get created that we have to backfill that may not you know, be the case. So I do think as you're looking at the budget process, really as we're looking at tighter budget years, right? And also the why around what are we not getting funded from the federal government? What is the real cost? I mean, there's people who, who rightfully want us to ensure that all students are fed. Well, we have to talk about how do we do that? What is the cost? What does that mean for the rest of our budget? And how can we get support from other government levels to make sure we can make sure students are fed? For example, is one example I give. Um, I, what I don't want to have happen is we have these great goals, we have this strategic plan, and then two, three years down the road, we haven't done what people expected, and we haven't set up the expectations to understand without the funding behind it, we aren't going to be able to have the quality staff and the work we need and the students fed and taken care of and all of those pieces. And I think we've got to do better about teasing out all of that together and creating that narrative. Thank you. Ms. Marin hasn't had a turn, so Ms. Marin. So I and several of us are going down to Williamsburg tonight or tomorrow to the Virginia School Board Association Conference, and I'm certainly eager to talk with colleagues from around the Commonwealth about 
the JLARC study. I hope that it will be a topic of discussion. And so I'm eager to share that data so people know, but also about the unfunded mandates with the federal government. And one other thing that I um, am eager to do at VSBA, as I am whenever I am not in Northern Virginia, but in Virginia, is to educate people about our student population today, that we've changed quite a bit from the last 10 and 20 years, and to really let people know that we have an amazingly diverse and also high need population. So I hope my colleagues will also be talking that up a lot. You know, I think VSBA has a lot of potential to help us advocate, but, um, you know, I'm thinking all of a sudden talking points and data points, and, you know, it's a lot to pull together literally on the last minute, but it's tomorrow, and the regional meeting is Thursday, or is it tomorrow? So, um, I don't know, and as far as the federal, I mean, it's, I would love to do more focused advocacy on that. I think that that is where we have a unique position. I'd rather spend my time advocating to higher ups that make policy and funding decisions and trying to figure out, you know, how we're going to make this plan work because we are the only ones that can do that. So I'm all for that if, if people want to jump into that work. Thank you, Ms. Marin. Uh, very quickly, Ms. Corbett Sanders, your go back, and then we will need to move to the next part. Thank you, and thank you for your explanation of the CEP. Um, as you and I have spoken, I really think we have to disaggregate the difference between providing free meals to everybody in a school and changing the class size for everybody in the same school. If what we're doing is going from 40 to 25 uh, percent on CEP, um, then we know it's going to cost us five million. But the remaining um, costs associated with by by shrinking the class size, um, I think that's one where we have to have a discussion as a board on whether or not we need to do something different on the um, on that piece. And, and just to be clear, so everybody knows, the 40% at VDOE is mandated. The 25% is optional. So a decision has not yet been made, which is why that's included on the initiatives not included. No, I think that's true. And then, uh, Ms. Marin, I actually would love to speak to you more about your advocacy because I, too, plan on spending my time at VSBA and have spent a lot of time with the regional elected leaders encouraging them to um, weigh in on the JLARC study because it is unacceptable that this school division has a $477 million underfunding between the JLARC study and um, at 1900 per kid and uh, the federal government. And so um, I'm happy to work with you on that. Thank you. Um, I, I will raise one more thing and my quick go back while the superintendent is here, which is just to go back to the um, to the budget resolution of last year that asked about program review ROI. I want to be sure that this is not just something we're adding into our language, but is actually having impact. So as you know it, how was that embedded into this year's process? Well, <clears throat> I know we've asked for, um, well, the process isn't done yet, <laughs> to be honest. This is the very first um, daylighting of our thinking around budget. And quite honestly, um, really, this forecast, fiscal forecast, is predicated on an ask around compensation. So um, this doesn't yet include the ROI or the attainment of KPIs with different programs um, or personnel, but it's um, really related to what would it cost us if we wanted within two years to be um, salary-wise at the top in our region, this is what it would take. And so, and not much else is getting funded really in any big way. So I think um, we'll get more to your point, Dr. Anderson. Um, the ROI around programs, I think, we'll see in the coming uh, months prior to the presentation of okay. the full budget. That's good to know. And the other piece that I would be remiss if I didn't raise is, as things are introduced to the budget, what has been the needs assessment? Because one of the points that was raised is, if we have a lot of advocacy around something, doesn't mean it's the most necessary thing and the most mission critical. So if we include it because we have that advocacy, why? If we don't include it, also oh, why? So I would love to see that, and I'm going to hold you to that commitment. Uh, so thank you. I, I also want to just put out in the room in this space that sometimes 
the things we get advocacy are really not that expensive, but they're a little more than a school can do, but a, not as much as a, a PTA or a booster or whatever can do. So we also need to, I think, modulate or manage expectations because there's some amazing things we can do that are not high cost and we don't want to have a scorched earth budget plan either where we start eliminating things that are really good for kids that then create other issues mm -hmm. that our students that because they can't do xyz now they're out doing mm -hmm. other things which we have to now fund to come out in a different direction so i just right. want us to always be mindful that um about that so, sure, thank you. that makes perfect sense. Just kind of pivoting a little bit, all of you should have the um, document in front of you that has responses that received either via the survey or through communications that Ms. Corbett Sanders and I have had with you. Um, as you can see, the two items that were, un uh, that were universally part of this board's um, themes are compensation and equity. But even within those two categories, there are some differences. So what I will ask for you to do first, there's two items. First, take a look at the other categories, workforce recruitment, mental health, other, which is huge, and budget review. And we're going to break up into small groups to kind of determine, do we still want, do we want to raise any of those issues to be a board priority? So in your group conversations, I would like for you to think about what could be priority one, priority two, and priority three, because we need to um, set ourselves up for success. So that's what I would like for you to do um, for workforce, mental health, other, and budget review. Priority one, two, and three. Or maybe not at all. Maybe this is it. And if this is it, that is okay too. The second piece I'd like for you to consider, as you look at compensation and equity, you could see that there's been some good feedback there, some of the things that we've talked about in this room. Should we be prioritizing within compensation? I heard from Ms. Um, Sizemore Heiser regarding, we have hard to fill positions, and I've been talking about differentiated compensation for a long time. Should that be priority? We just heard from Ms. McLaughlin in terms of targeting teachers. We heard from Ms. Um, Omesh about targeting some different groups. Do we even want to prioritize within the compensation and the equity buckets? So those are the two asks. Prioritizing workforce on down, priority one, two, and three, and, or priori and prioritizing within each of the two buckets with which we have um, board consensus. So we will be breaking out into some small groups of three, so we have a little bit more discussion and we'll do some breakouts. One of you, please be the scribe and just write on this document so that it could be returned to Ms. Corbett Sanders and, um, and I for us to follow up to, to create the board's resolutions. What question have you? Yeah, I, I, I'm just concerned about this exercise. I'm gonna be honest. I mean. There are 12 of us, I get that. But I mean, I'm looking at this, especially in the, in the, the breakout of what compensation's being defined as, equity, what it's being defined as. I mean, I don't wanna be giving feedback even on either of those because I don't think that's established where we as a collective board are even in the subcategories. So I really appreciate that, you know, trying to start from somewhere, but I also recognize that only four of you remaining. Eight of us are leaving, and some of us aren't even here around the table for various reasons this afternoon. So I don't know. I'm a little nervous to be sitting here working off of this because I, I don't feel like it's reflective of, of certainly what I've heard over the years of this sitting board. And I appreciate that, but at the end of the day, we are trying to build a resolution to give guidance to the superintendent in terms of where do we want for her to focus on. That's what we have been doing for the last three years. Um, that resolution speaks about the board's priorities and where we need to be focused because the budget, it's ours, we own that, and we decide what gets funded and what does not. I know this is not an easy exercise. And again, if those two that's posted on the board are it, we could leave it just like that. I want to pay attention to the other information that board members have contributed to this process. And I don't have in a, in a great way of doing that rather than instead of just putting it in front of you. 
Well, I guess I'll just I'll just close it out this way. Mm -hmm. I've said this every time. It feels like the tail is wagging the dog. The superintendent is the leader of the school division. She's the operational expert. She and her team should have given us what they believe, as of now, they can see the most mission critical. We could have then said collectively as a board, we see that and we're going to proclaim it to go forth and build that budget. I am not happy right now that this is basically a scattering of school board members' thoughts based on their own passions, but it is not strategic in any way at all. And so I'm not trying to be negative Nelly here, but wow. I mean, Dr. Reed, just my two cents for when you're going to work with your next board. This right now, Dr. Anderson and Ms. Corbett Sanders, not set up for success in my humble opinion. And in the future, you got to lead on this one from the very beginning because when you wear the crown of being the, the, the CEO of the school division, Thank it you, is Ms. not McLaughlin. okay for this. We have a lot of people who want to chime into this. And again, this is not even something we have to do. If we collectively decide we are good with the two themes that are up there, that are broad, that is okay too. But a lot of people expressed a lot of different thoughts in terms of what they want to see in our resolution. So um, I'm going to let Ms. Corbett Sanders speak as somebody who's been working on this from the inside, and then Ms. Omesh. So I'm going to make a suggestion. Um, if you look at this list, there are a number of things that are um, under various categories that actually fall into either compensation or equity. And so what I think would make it much easier for the focus of this afternoon would be for people to take a look at the list and say, okay, from a compensation piece, what are the things that you think are really critical to add into a description of compensation? We have a number of items up there, but there are also, I mean, compensation is really all about workforce recruitment and retention. And so if you, if we had as our and unfortunately, only three people actually use the term workforce uh, recruitment and retention. But if we actually use that as the capstone and then put underneath it, there's a compensation piece. And we could have, as part of the compensation piece, uh, differentiated compensation, the stipends that we have spoken about quite often, uh, living wage. We've, we've had a general agreement. We've actually had policy work done in each of these areas. And then um, add to it review of staffing formulas based on what we've heard earlier today. And um, what is that? Is that oh, that's I over there. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, and then similarly, when we talk about going to equity, what are those things on this list that we believe actually contribute to the equity piece? And then under other, are there things listed under mental health, um, other, and budget review that we would actually fully define something that um, clearly does right. it? And so that's kind of to frame the discussion today um, and have working groups work on how they would structure it. Because I know that, Dr. Anderson, what you were trying to do, which is absolutely correct, is you did not want to um, predetermine for this predetermine. board. Predetermine, yes. Right. Thank you. This is our work, and so we have to engage in it. Um, we're going to have just one more comment, and then we're going to have the conversations in our small groups. So, Ms. Omesh. Yeah, I mean, I'm mindful that we're discussing how to do the thing that we might not have time to do. So I wanted to... <laughs> That never um, happens. Yeah, I guess to Dr. Re to, to the credit of this process, the reason I think we're here is because we've tried it before where the superintendent will come and present something and then the board shoots it down and then it's like, well, I didn't know what you guys wanted. Right. And so that, this resolution idea came out of that um, a few years back. Having said that, maybe we can actually discuss like, and this is an ask to my colleagues, like how we prioritize these as well. Because to me, I'm thinking, again, I have the things I think matter and everyone, that's too arbitrary. I'm almost like, can we peg this to like a Maslow's hierarchy of needs or some kind of thing where we're like, a kid who walks into a school and is not able to communicate with the staff because we have not provided supports, that's a different situation than like, hey, how about we add these cool things to the curriculum and like maybe, we can inspire kids. To, don't get me wrong, that's good too. But th there is a weight to how we assign the things that matter on this list 
some of which are like basic necessities of a kid existing and, and like being a part of that school versus adding above and beyond and excelling. So if, if I may ask you guys, please just kind of help us because as soon as the placards go up, we're going to just do this. Can we have these conversations in our small groups? Write on this form all of these ideas and then we will bring it back to the budget group and we will engage in that conversation. So I'm going to take the liberty of not taking any more placards and just inviting you all. We have three right there, so I'm gonna invite you to get together. The three at the end get together. Abra, you can get together with us. So we'll have three teams of three. Engage in these thoughts, write them down, and then I'm happy to share out after we've had the opportunity. If you feel comfortable to offer any feedback, do so. If you're not yet comfortable to offer that feedback, that is okay too. I think we have plenty to do there, the compensation and equity. The other thing you could lean into is a strategic plan and the goal report we've just had. That should shift some thinking. So we're going to take the next, it is 3.51, we're going to take the next 15 minutes for you to engage in those small, smaller group conversations. List everything on this document that you need for us, to, for Karen and I to know, and then we will collect it and bring that back to the finance group. Thank you. Appreciate that.
All right, folks, I think we're going to come back. I do want to thank you all for engaging in this process because we do want it to be what the board thinks, not what Ricardi Anderson believes the board should think, which is why it was really important to get you to engage with what the um, our colleagues, the feedback that um, was given. So very quickly, we it is 4.09. We are going to spend just a couple of minutes asking each group just to share out some of the thoughts that were um, discussed. So I will pick one person from each group to share, and then we will wrap up our meeting. I believe our next step, all of this information that has been talked about here and that you will give me on your documents will go to inform the resolution, which will be voted upon next month, early December. And Ms. Tolan is confirming that shortly. Um, that's information to the superintendent regarding the boundaries of the budget. So we will start with Donna Koufax. I know she took notes there. Yes, I did, Dr. Anderson. All right. So um, our group was Ms. Omesh, Ms. Sizemore Heiser, and myself. And we looked at the FCPS's, our, 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 our school board's um, suggested budget themes. And we went with um, two strategic plan alignment, and then we expanded on that, and then we went with compensation. So compensation, um, one of the things we would ask to consider perhaps is living wage and differentiated pay, um, meaning, um, as it was explained within the group, not necessarily give everyone a little bit of the pie, but give some people a lot more of the pie, and then offer other bits of compensation to other parties. Um, as far as strategic plan alignment, then what we did is we didn't so we didn't have time to go back and match what our conversation was in regard to our current list in front of us. But we actually went back through the strategic plan and and, and parsed out. Um, and these are not in any order because we, of course, didn't have time to do that. But we have seven, and one that we talked about were expanding pre-K readiness. Uh, expand, expanding pre-K to ensure pre-K to ensure kindergarten readiness, um, language and communication access, meaning any kind of translation skills, any kind of special pads, any type of things that people need. Um, inclusion, um, make sure we have a professional development training and support to ex to make our administrators and staff understand what an inclusive environment is. Ensure a safe learning environment, and that's extremely important. That stands on its own. Um, we talked about expanding what we talked about this morning, ensuring that we can, ex putting money behind our mouth, what we talked about this morning, expanding access to advanced math and CTE courses in as many schools, or at least we, so you can get them regionally and then uh, funding um, for our neediest learners on numeracy and literacy. Thank you, that is very much appreciated. And I think while some of those items that you've listed are clearly identified in the strategic plan, some are not. So it's really important to elevate um, the needs that you've just described. So if I can get that form, thank you. Um, Ms. Tolan, was it you who had the document for your team? Ms. Oh, you already gave it to me. Do you want to present it really quickly? Oh, I think this is it. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. We were uh, very succinct, and we actually used it in the term terminology of uh, executive expectations, I believe. So it said, it is, it is our expectation that this budget, that the budget proposed by the superintendent will be in alignment with the strategic plan, focusing on competitive compensation and equity. Um, and then asking for clarity as to how you would implement both of those objectives. They, go ahead. Yeah, I, I think what I remember in that was the third component on the budget review that we were yes. going to capture in, Dr. Reed. That is a third bucket of great importance that we are expecting it's in alignment with the strategic plan, that your team is going to look at um, you know, the, um, what do we say, the analytics the anal and the yeah. needs assessment yeah, and Yeah, a ROI. needs assessment mm -hmm. and of... Consistent of, with last year's guidance. Right, but yeah. the, the goal is that this isn't just how we're going to do 
whatever new money we have, this is what we're going to do. We really want to see what are the cost savings that you might all find, or what is it the programs that aren't giving the ROI, and so we're going to redirect funds in a different way. Um, so that was the third strategic focus that we wanted you and your team to know about. Thank you. While I didn't get a chance to really contribute to a team, I, I think for me one of the most essential pieces is that last component. Um, we have finite resources. We are not going to get all of the things under the sun, but how do we reallocate some of the things that no longer serve us? You know, something that you said, Dr. Reed, still sticks with me. We could pay a lot of the people very little, or we could pay fewer people more. I know these decisions are not easy or hard, but it's the reality of it. We have to make decisions that will focus on our most mission critical work and what our needs are, which we talked about for two hour, four hours earlier. So I think that is it. I have everybody's feedback, so you all will look to see, um, to find a language draft that will come to you, and I'm sure it will be wordsmith to death, and then we will present that next month for the board to vote upon and to give the superintendent guidance on what is it that we want to see in this budget. So is it the intent that this will be a new business item on the 20th and um, of I am November not sure what Ms. Tolan's intents will vote are. for it in the first um, meeting of December. That way it's timely to allow the superintendent to uh, to inform the superintendent's well, budget. May I ask that maybe we discuss that offline because I know everybody's jumping off ship, some tonight, some tomorrow, and I want to be sure that all of our colleagues have enough time to wrestle with the language before anything is posted. Well, given that we have three board meetings left, <laughs> I, I do think we it will be here was to post it as new business on Monday. And then, um, you know, and aim for the vote on the 4th, on December 4th. If it can be posted as new business without the exact language, because I don't want for anybody to be surprised. I think we can. Okay. Thank you. Have a good afternoon, all. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Burden. And team. <laughs>